outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. The affiliated stations present Escape. All of Fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. From almost the beginning of time, the tellers of tales have been fascinated by the story of the being who leaves this life, makes a short trip to the regions of the dead, and then tries to find his way back again into the land of the living. Not always an easy thing to do. In fact, the ancient Roman poet Virgil said, if we may be permitted to update his words a bit, the way down to hell is a cinch, but the way back may present a few difficulties. Our story involves just such a trip. Why, why are you torturing me this way, you, my, my own mother? I'm not your mother. Your mother is dead. What you see before you... It's horrible. I'm afraid of you. Where's the... Love you always showed for me the kindness, the gentleness. Look into my eyes. What do you see? Dead, black, yellow eyes with no pupils. Show pity on me, Katie. Show mercy. I have no mercy, no pity. I am a body without a soul. A living corpse that wishes you everything evil. Evil, because I loathe and despise you, my son. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Death of Halpin Fraser, is based on the classic short story by the celebrated American author Ambrose Bierce. It was adapted and especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The End of Life is often accompanied by greater changes than many of us will admit. We have heard, for example, that the spirit of a dead person may occasionally come back to haunt the living, 
taking the physical form of the body that spirit once inhabited. But there are other times, we are told, when the body returns without the spirit, without the soul that had animated that body in life. Our story is concerned with just such a phenomenon. A dark night in the midsummer of the 1870s. A young man waking from a dreamless sleep in a forest near the Napa Valley in California lifted his head from the earth and staring into the blackness screamed, Catherine! Catherine Aru! He says nothing more. He knows no reason why he should have spoken that particular name. The young man is Halpin Fraser. And although he is unaware of it at that moment, Halpin Fraser is in the deepest of trouble. Earlier that same day, he had gone hunting in the hills west of the valley, looking for doves and other such small game. Late in the afternoon, the sky had suddenly become overcast with threatening clouds, and he had lost his bearings. Well... Where am I? Is this the way back? I, if I turn right, this rotting tree stump... No, that seems to lead nowhere. Everything's become so dark. How, how long have I been walking? It must be hours. Oh, I'm completely exhausted. My, my legs, I can't lift my legs. Another step I like lead. My head. Wait a minute, that... That little clean over there near the twisted roots of that large madrona tree, would it? Wouldn't it be the sensible thing to stop trying to find my way in the dark? Yeah, I'll go to sleep right here. Sleep. Sleep, I must get some sleep. And in the morning, when it gets lighter, everything'll be fine. With nothing under him but the dry leaves and the damp earth, and nothing over him but the branches from which the leaves had fallen and the sky from which the earth had fallen, Halpin Fraser fell asleep. Hours later, in the middle of the night... Catherine! Catherine LaRue! Catherine LaRue. Who is Catherine LaRue? I don't know. I have no idea who... Who are you? I, I can't see you. Get up. Up. And start walking. Walk where? It's still dark. Along that dusty road in front of you. They look so white. Where, where's that strange yellow green light coming from? It's, it's blinding. Keep walking. Where does this road lead? Where are we going? Why is I walk on my feet making no sound? Look around you. Yeah. Your body is casting no shadow. True. Uh, why, why should that be? What, what are those noises? Those broken whispers in a strange tongue. I, I almost understand them. But not quite. What do you think they are? No, but those sounds seem like part of some monstrous conspiracy against me, a conspiracy against our body and against us. So what are they? Oh, help them. You will soon find out. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. I, I must find something to drink. Where are you going, Halpin? Over there. There's a pressure in the ground. Where a wheel has passed, there's a little pool from a recent rain. I'm, I'm going to drink from it. Go ahead, help. Cup your hands and drink deeply. Drink for it. <gasps> there's no water at all. It's a pool of blood. My hands are dripping blood. Look down at the patches of dust between the wheel waves and the roads. I spat with red as if it'd been raining blood. Where are we? Who are you? Keep walking, Halpin. Halpin, have you considered that possibly you're being punished for something? Punished? For something I've done, something I can't recall? Think back. Try to recall. 
struck in your memory the last ten years of your life. No, I can't! I won't! Think back, Halpern. Think very hard. Think back. Think back. Think back. Halpern, it would seem your mother has done it again. Her party tonight is surely the peak of the Nashville social season. Mother certainly does know how to give a party. <laughs> Look at all those beautiful young women twirling around in their pretty party dresses. And the young men so handsome and gallant as they dance with them. In spite of the fact that some of those young men have only one arm or one eye. <laughs> Thanks to bleeding their hearts out at places like Chicken Morgan, Bull Run. Now that's all past, son. We mustn't think back. Besides, we can be grateful that, uh, thanks to some of my good friends, you were spared the worst dangers of the battlefield. How well I know, Father. Will you just take a look at old Ben Ashford cavorting around on the dance floor with that handsome young lady? <laughs> Spry as a man half his age. Get to know old Ben, son. A real good man to know. I'm sure of it, Father. A person of great power can be most helpful to a young man beginning his career in the profession of the law... Are you listening to me helping? Excuse me, Father. My mind was on something else for the moment. Hmm? Oh, I think I see what you mean. Isn't that Oscar Shelby's daughter over from Memphis? That's right. Mary Ellen Shelby. Yeah. Juicy little morsel, isn't she? I admire your taste. Oh, Fraser, what dark and terrible thoughts are you trying to implant in the innocent mind of my darling son? <laughs> Evening, Katie. You look beautiful tonight. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. You both enjoying yourself? It's a fine party, Katie. Oh, just trying to be good wife to you, Ben. And a devoted mother to you, Halpin. It's not every day that a young man just six months out of law school is promoted to a junior partnership in one of the most distinguished legal firms in the state. I'm real proud of you, Halpin, my love. This part is just my way of showing it. Well, uh, I did help a little, you know. Oh, no, there's Sue Cameron over there waving to me. Will you excuse me, Halpin, while I hobble over to her on these poor arthritic legs of mine and see what's on her mind? Oh, and Halpin, after the party, do come into my bedroom and kiss me goodnight like a good boy, won't you? So many things I want to talk to you about. Her poor arthritic legs, her poor arthritic brain. There's nothing wrong with her legs. You know as well as I do, Alpin, she's still using that one to get your sympathy. She'll be asking you to dance with her any minute. Would you please excuse me, Father? Certainly, son, and convey your father's compliments to Mary Ellen Shelby. That's one of the prettiest pieces of woman flesh I've seen in many a day. Thank you, Father. I think you ought to know I'm about to ask that pretty piece of woman flesh to be my wife. But you're a grown man, Halpin. There's no reason for you to submit to these humiliations any longer. I will not listen to you talk about my mother. Halpin, dear, you just refuse to face the truth. The attachment she has for you is... is beautiful. Beautiful? Is that what you think? My Katie is devoted to me as I am to her. The way your mother thinks of you is not with the usual devotion of a mother for her son. And you... You even call her by her first name. I love my mother. But it's proper you should. But... Let's not talk about it anymore. Oh, the important thing right now is you and me. You know I love you more deeply and more completely than anything in this whole world. You love me well enough to leave Tennessee, to accept the offer your firm has made, to establish a branch office in San Francisco, 2,500 miles away from Nashville, with very few chances of ever returning. I think so. And breaking out of this... Sick iron grip of your mother and father holding you in, because that's what you're going to have to do if you want me. As long as you're by my side, my wife, my intelligent, my obstinate, my beautiful darling, I can do anything. Oh, I love you, Halpin, with all my heart, my body, and my soul. Kiss me. <sighs> I'll tell Mother, my decision tonight. 
after everyone's left. Oh, there you are, you two naughty children. Hiding away from the rest of us. Oh, not really, Katie. We thought we'd set this one dance, huh, Mrs. Fraser? You have no idea how enjoyable it is to spend a moment or two alone with your very charming son. I have a very good idea, my dear. And I'm delighted to share it with you. But just for a moment or two. Besides, such beauty as yours, Miss Shelby, should not be hidden from the public view. Would you both excuse me, please? I'll be right back, well, there's no denying that Mary Ellen Shelby's a very attractive young woman. In a common sort of way. Mother. Katie. Mary Ellen and I are planning to get married. <laughs> oh, you, oh you, can't, you can't really, you can't really mean that, Albert. I do, Katie, I've... Asked her to marry me. Oh, but you're still a child. How can you be thinking about marriage? I am 22, Katie. Exactly. Have your little fun, I say, if you must, but marry? Why, oh, heaven's name, why not? Well, you're just beginning your career as a lawyer. A career that promises to be a brilliant one. Besides, nobody could ever separate us from each other. Could they happen? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not yet ready to give you up to another woman. I'm sorry I was gone so long. Forgive me. Uh, we'll be serving supper in the next five minutes. Before we do, happen, uh, Mr. Fraser, sir, I would be honored to be asked for the pleasure of this next dance. I'm awfully sorry, Mother. I promised it to Mary Ellen. You have? And the dance after that. And the one after that. You made a fine beginning, Halpin. Keep thinking back and keep walking straight ahead. Straight through this archway. This tunnel of overhanging trees. Oh, twisted yellow vines are blocking my way there. They're catching me at the throat. Choking me. Just follow the glare. Light ahead of you at the end of the tunnels. You haven't far to go. Just a few more steps, Halpin. Halpin, Fraser. Mother. We meet again, Halpin. I told you we would. It's taken a long time. Such a long time since they placed me in my. We read that the grave unites us all. The grave, where even the great find rest. That small piece of the churchyard that fits every one of us. And for most, a grave gives comfort. But for some, as we are about to see, the grave becomes a place of unrest rather than a place of rest. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Ambrose Bierce himself, on whose story the death of Halpin Fraser is based, gave this definition of a grave. Done with the work of breathing, done with all the world, the mad race run through to the end. The golden goal attained is found to be a hole. Having left its grave, its hole, if you like, the dead body of Halpin Fraser's mother taunts her son with a promise she made when she was among the living. Look at me, Halpin. Look into my eyes. Look into the drawn, bloodless face of your mother's hand. Try to recall the promise of his face. Stop torturing me. You and all the rest of you in this weird place of evil. We will help in good time. Remember that night ten years ago. After the war. After all the others had gone. Sit, 
closer to me, help. Here, near the head of the bed. Now, be a darling, and uh, massage the back of my neck, the littlest bit. Gently, lovingly, as long as you can. Oh, Katie, your hair is so long and so beautiful. And it smells so sweet. Oh. How's that? Feel good? Oh, wonderful, sweetheart. Wonderful. Your fingers are so strong. Oh, I'm beginning to relax for the first time in days. Katie, would you greatly mind if I decided to move to California to San Francisco? I'm not sure I understand you, son. My firm has asked me to set up a new branch in California. They, they think there can be a great future there for the company and, and for me. Surely you never go. Oh, well, you, you don't mean you seriously think of moving away from Nashville forever? Well, possibly. And, and Mary Ellen would go with me as my wife. Well, I, I, I just never thought you'd have the heart to do this to me, Halpin. Not after all we've been meant to each other. Send us away with your blessing, Katie. It's the best way. Well, all last night, I... I lay awake, tortured by this miserable, painful arthritis. My fingers, my legs. And by the light of the full moon that was pouring in through the window... I kept staring at that portrait of you oh, on the wall. Oh, Katie, please. Now, don't interrupt please. me. There you were, as you are now, young, strong, handsome. And as I gazed at that painting, a mist, a cloud of some kind, seemed to cover over your beautiful features to color your face completely. As I looked, I realized it had been painted as if a thin cloth had been placed over your sweet face. The kind of cloth is placed over the features of a corpse. Oh, Katie, that's ridiculous. Look at that painting now. Now, you must not laugh at me. As I continued to study the painting, I saw below the edge of the cloth the dark blue marks of fingers on your throat. As if you had been strangled to death. Mother, why do you tell me this? Now, what is that supposed to mean? It means that you may never go to California. Katie, dear, that doesn't make sense. Well, I can, I can hardly bring myself to say this. But if you go, somehow you will meet your death there. In the next few years. <laughs> By strangulation. Now, don't you take it lightly. I know what I'm saying. You take me with you. Oh, I'd be so little trouble. I, I hear they have fine medicinal springs over there. And in California, I could get better and I could... Oh, I could take care of my little boy. See that nothing evil ever happens Katie, to you me. listen to me. You will be killed if you leave me. So will the Shelby girl. And I will die, too. Katie, Mary, Ellen, and I have decided we are leaving in a week. Well, in that case, I... Well, I suppose there's nothing for me to do except... Give you the blessing you asked for. Thank you, Katie. Well, as a wedding present for your wife, I'll... I'll give her the brooch I wore tonight at the party. Grandma's... Pink Carl Brooks. And her mama's before her. Been in the family almost 200 years. Mm. And for you, well, go over to my dresser and um, open the top drawer on the right. You see anything unusual? This hunting knife? That's for you. My papa's pearl-handled hunting knife. Forged out of the finest Toledo steel. And uh, uh, take that little portrait of me in the gold frame, too. Oh, thank you, Katie. You are most generous as well as understanding. Mary Ellen will be pleased, and I am most grateful. Kiss me good night, Halpin. Good night, my darling Katie. No matter where you go, no matter what may happen, I promise you that you and I will surely meet again. Sometime, somehow, someplace. I will not break that promise. Good night, my love. Oh, oh you coming to bed? 
That'd soon happen. On my way, Mary Ellen. Oh, nice. In all the years we've been in California, this must be the worst. Glad I didn't have to try to get around the streets of San Francisco tonight. <laughs> What's that you've been reading? Oh, uh, a little thing I picked up at the bookshop this afternoon by a 16th century English theologian. For greater change is wrought by death than hath been generally believed, whereas in general the spirit of a dead man cometh back upon occasion, yet it hath happened that the body without the spirit hath sometimes walked. What kind of morbid nonsense is that? Listen to the rest. And it is attested by those who have encountered a corpse so raised from the dead that the cadaver hath none of the natural kindly affection it may have had in life, but only hate and evil altogether. In other words, a dead person can come back without a spirit and without a soul, only in the shape of the body it had in life. And comes back as something hateful and ugly. He says it's happened. Oh, my darling, that is positively, unequivocally fascinating. <laughs> May I have that precious book, please? What are you doing, Happen? Tossing it in the wastebasket where it belongs. Oh. oh, it's silly to bother your pretty head with such depressing and disturbing thoughts. Now, if you don't mind, I am going to concentrate on you. Both soul and body. Both. With your kind permission, my darling, Katie. Your darling who? I am not Katie. Oh, for, forgive me, sweetheart. That was a stupid slip of the tongue. Whatever made me do that? And so, my dear son, on Sunday last, your darling mother and my beloved wife passed on to her makeup. She was buried, of course, in the family cemetery here in Nashville. A pity you could not have been with her at the end. As she gasped her final breath, the last words she spoke were, Right helping that I shall keep my promise. He and I will meet again. Now, what exactly she meant by that, I have the slightest idea. In any event, the widow Struthers and I send you and your wife our kindest regards and warmest feelings. Your devoted father, Bo Fraser. I had the feeling all day long with before this letter came that something was wrong. Oh, I can understand how you feel, Happen. The letter is dated almost a month ago. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Happen. Oh, now put out the light and do try to get some sleep. You said you had a busy day tomorrow. I have. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, dear. Where were you when I needed you most? I, I, I couldn't help it. I died without my son's gentle hands on my cheek, without his warm lips on my forehead. You never loved me, Halpin, did you? Never really loved me. You know, that's not true. I always loved you, Kate. I always will. Are you all right? Are you all right? Can I get you something? Oh, oh. oh I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Mary Ellen. You've been talking in your sleep again. Uh, oh, my darling, try to go back to sleep. Uh, I don't think I can. Oh, let me get you a cup of warm milk. Oh, no, thank you, Katie. I don't think it... Katie? Not again, Halpin. I'm sorry. Katie is dead. And we are both well rid of her. I love my mother. That was always plain enough. To me and to the rest of the world. You take care of what you say and... Halpin, I will not be forced to compete for your love and your affection with a dead woman. She played on your sympathies with a whole bag of cheap female... You are speaking of my mother, a sick woman. A very sick woman. Oh, but not the way you mean. You were her disease. You, her young, handsome son, tied to her with an unbreakable cord that led right back to her womb. Mary Ellen, I think you've said enough. Well, you've asked for it, her strong young son, who turns out to be nothing but a sad little weakling... Mary Ellen! Step! That's enough! Oh. You will never speak to me that way again. You understand? And that is the last time you will ever strike me. The very last... Where are you going? What are you up to? 
Here are your precious mother's wedding gifts. The pig coral brooch she gave to me, which I have Ma never worn. My grandmother's brooch, you broke in it. And the picture of your darling mother can keep it company. Mary Ellen. And here's your grandfather's beautiful pearl handled hunt. Are you out of your mind? Put down that knife. Will not, not until I... Stop that knife, you fool! Oh. Jeff, will you... Kathy, give me that knife. You kept me close, my heart. Give me that knife. You've got to get away from me, you mama's boy, you great big nothing who just looked like you. a man. Watch out, Mary Ellen. I have the knife now. Go back to your mother's grave and let her suffer you. you. No. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. with blood on me. And see you murder. You murder. I'm not sure. Do you begin to realize where you are? Uh, I think. Hear me back to. A place to which few of us return. And are you beginning to recognize who I am? That voice of yours is so familiar. I, I'm sure I know it. you. I am you, Alpen. You. It would seem that Halpin Fraser is being exposed to what we might call cruel and inhuman punishment. Cruel? Maybe. Inhuman or unhuman? No question. Will this unusual form of punishment come anywhere near fitting the crime? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. In ancient Britain, a dead body, a corpse, was also known as a lich. At the entrance to the cemetery, the coffin which carried the remains of the deceased would pass under the roofed lich gate and be placed with attendant ceremony on a lich stone to await the arrival of the priest or clergyman. The lich gate was sometimes called the resurrection gate. The body or lich of Katie Fraser, devoid of spirit or soul, seems to have resurrected itself. It continues to torment Halpin Fraser. Why are you doing this to me? You... Are you trying to tell me that my being here is some kind of atonement? For the murder of Mary Ellen. For ripping open the throat of your young wife. That is the very least you have to atone for. She was trying to kill me. Everybody knows that. Do they? Do they really believe that? Of course. Then why did you run away from San Francisco the day your wife was placed in her grave? Did you hide away in that little mountain town? A town where your murdered wife was buried. In the graveyard of a little white church. A little white church. I, I don't know. Did you think changing your name after you came to the little town would help? You're trying to confuse me, both of you. But you did change your name, Halpin. From Fraser to LaRue. Of all names, why did you choose that one? LaRue! About you, I don't know. Why, you torture me this way, you kid, you above all my own mother. I am not your mother. Your mother is dead. Where is the love you always show for me? Where is the kindness, the gentleness? They all seem to be swallowed up in fear. And hatred, Captain. Cold hatred. Why, why do you hate me? You still don't know why. I will not stay here and listen to you too. No. Where will you go? Where, Halpin? You'd like to run away? Go ahead. Uh, uh, I can't. I feel like lead as if they were glued to the ground. They won't move. Run your arms, your hands, your fingers. I can't move them either. It's as if they were frozen stiff. Oh, take pity on me. The apparition which you see before you has no pity. Katie, 
Lady. Help me! Holka! The night fog is so thick I can hardly see. Well, this way! And stay as close as you can. Hear those voices, help. They're coming to get you. What do I do? You're going to feel the agony of a hangman's noose around your neck. You'll hear the loud snap. He's got it! I won't! Listen to you! Remember the dark blue mark I saw around your neck on your foot. I remember, I remember the marks of the hangman's rope! The time has come, Helpen. The last breath is about to be squeezed out of your body. Further, Little White Church, no more than half a mile. There's no graveyard next to it. Imagine two grown men, you a county sheriff, and I a big city detective walking along a road on a miserable, foggy morning like this. Where you can't see your hand in front of your face. On their way to a little country graveyard. You know, I didn't get you here armed all the way from San Francisco just for a pleasant walk. Well, there is the matter of a $500 reward for the capture of wife killer, Mr. Halpin Fraser, most recently known as LaRue. Uh, every night, he comes to the old deserted graveyard with the little white church. Well, that's where they buried his wife. Uh, couldn't you fellas have sense enough to suspect that he might sometime come back to pay a visit to our grave? Well, in fact, we figured it'd be the very last place he'd return to. And he's been there every night for the last three weeks. And often stays till dawn. He's armed. Matter of fact, one night last week, he took a shot at me. If we can take him, half the reward is yours, of course. How much further? A couple of hundred yards or so. Hold it a minute. Look at that strange light ahead of us. Even through this thick fog, kind of sickly, greenish, yellow light. Could that be him? They, they found something. Don't move! All right, let's go. Follow me into the graveyard and watch your step. Right behind you. Just past his broken gate. All right, all right. Quiet down, boys. Quiet, quiet. There is nothing here. I've never seen anything like this in my life. You'd never even know these were graves. Just discolored stones and a few rotting boards leaning at the craziest angles. Some of the folks who live near here call it the village of the forgotten dead. There's that strange light again. Like a green ball of light swirling around in space on its own axis. Seems to be beckoning to us. Shall we go see what it is? Now, careful. Let's push our way through this growth of young trees. Dogs are out of something. I don't see anything yet. Well, let's follow that light. What on earth are they after? Mr. Holker. Look over there. The body of a man lying on top of a grave. On his back. Legs wide apart. One stiff arm reaching up into the air as if to push someone away, and the other near the throat. Both hands tightly clenched. It's beginning to disintegrate. Uh, he's been dead for weeks. Until we can file a formal report with the county coroner, let's make note of what we've got here. Oh, I've got a new book and a pencil. Good. Now take this down. Attitude of the deceased indicates desperation and resistance. To what? Look here. Here's a shotgun, a mesh game bag, remains of two birds. Yeah, now write this down. Evidence of furious struggle. The throat and face deep purple in color, almost black. The neck bent backwards, the eyes staring, ready to burst from their sockets. The lips dry and cracked open. The protruding tongue, black and swollen, throat covered with contusions. Not just finger marks, but bruises and lacerations. I'll bet five dollars this was done by Fraser, the man we're looking for. You better save your money, Geraldson. 
Look there at his feet under those leaves. A little red leather notebook with the initials HF on the cover. Anything in it? Uh, something scrawled in red ink. Hardly legible. Red ink? Uh, with some kind of crude writing instrument. Can you make it out? Um, I, I, Halpin Fraser, most recently known as Halpin LaRue, LaRue being my mother's maiden name, admit to the murder of my wife, Mary Ellen Fraser. I'm now about to face my own death. Death by strangulation. Well, I guess that settles the identity of the body. Now, how would he know he was going to be strangled and still be able to write about it? I'm just reading what's written. Well, let's clear away some of the weeds in front of the headstone. Mary Ellen Fraser. He was murdered on his own wife's grave. Let's get the coroner up here right away. What... What did you step on? Wooden board from the head of a grave. Fallen on the ground. Well, can you make out the lettering on the board? Uh, just barely. Paint's faded away and part of the board's rotted off. Let's see. It says... Here lies Catherine LaRue. F-R-A. That's all there is of the name. Born... January 29. Can't make out the year. Died June 13, 1874. Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville? What on earth is the headboard of a grave in Nashville, Tennessee? A whole continent away. Doing here in a graveyard in the Napa Valley of California. I wouldn't know, Mr. Holker. I wouldn't know. Catherine. Catherine LaRue. Catherine LaRue. Yes, Captain. Here I am. I've traveled a long way. A lonely way. You and I, Kitty. We're together again. Together as we once were. It's taken time, but at last you and I are one again, Halpin. One again. You two are a body without a spirit, a body without a soul. Unloved, unloving, uncared for, uncaring. But we are together again, aren't we, Hoffman? My son. The drenching fog that had been growing all over the little white church began to extend over the entire valley like an endless canopy, opaque and gray. The birds sat like silent ghosts in their hiding places. And two lost, abandoned souls found themselves united in an eerie graveyard. United in hatred, bitterness, and spite. I'll be back shortly. Ambrose Bierce, whose tale was the basis for our mystery, was born in a small town in Ohio in 1842. He moved to San Francisco, where his writing became extremely popular. In 1913, at the age of 71, he disappeared into Mexico. Every trace of him was lost forever. Is it conceivable that he, like Halpin Fraser, might have met his end at the hands of some Mexican lich? It's interesting to speculate. Our cast included Michael Wager, Grace Matthews, Arnold Moss, Patricia Elliott, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And 
now, a preview of our next tale. You have to leave. Answer me one thing first. Anything. You won't let whatever happens change you? You'll stay the way you are? Why should I change? Supposing I wasn't alive. Oh, Sarah, then I wouldn't be alive either. It isn't always that easy to die. Sarah? Sarah? What are you talking about? Promise me, darling. If anything happens, just... Just keep on being my same, loving, kind, gentle Alvin. What crazy talk is this? I'm... I'm Alvin Freiberg. I'm, I'm 30 years old. If I don't know what I am now, I'm in sad condition. I'm only thinking of the future. Oh, the devil with the future. We're living now. That's just the trouble, my darling. We're not. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Hey, weirdos, I am finally back from filming that horror movie. We still got a couple days left, but I am back in the studio. I can give you an update on our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser, and from what I'm seeing, I should probably leave more often <laughs> because you guys have blown it away. Uh, last time I looked, we were a little under 2500 We are now at $4,259. We, we are just over $700 from our goal of $5,000. I cannot believe that I just opened up the app and saw that. I am... I, I'm... I'm speechless. I, I really don't know what to say about that. I do have a lot of people to thank because I've been gone for a while, and I'm sure that I will miss some of the names, and I apologize for that. Unfortunately, the system doesn't give me the dates that all of these came in. They just give me the order. But Christine gave 20. Howard gave 20. Paul gave $1,000. Paul, thank you, man. Anonymous gave $25. Mary gave $200. Kristen gave $10. Michelle gave, uh, gave $200. Danielle gave $100. Another anonymous donation for $30. Ronald gave $10. Carla gave $25. Lisa gave $5. Thank you, Lisa. Wendy gave $30. Gloria gave $10. AM came in with $5. Morgan gave sent in $100. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Patricia gave $25. Jaina, $56. Carrie, $30. Jacqueline, $100. Kristen gave $5. Diana gave $10. Robert, $100. And Danielle, I don't know if this is the same Danielle or a different one, but another $100. Thank you so much to all of you who have given to our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser. We still have three days left. It ends Halloween night at midnight. We do this once a year, celebrating Weird Darkness Birthday, which started in October of 2015, and it's just something that's really close to me. I suffer from depression myself, so raising money to help organizations that help others who struggle with depression just seemed to make sense. And by coincidence, October does happen to be uh, Depression Awareness Month. Just happened to work out that way. So if you'd like to make a donation, you can do so at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. While you're there, you can also watch a short video that I made to explain what we're doing a bit more. You can also learn about the different organizations that we will be supporting because we will take the total, divide it four ways, and it'll go to four different organizations that help people with depression. Again, I'm only conducting this fundraiser this month. It ends at midnight, October 31st. So please give right now while you're thinking about it, because we're almost out of time, weirddarkness.com slash overcoming. That's weirddarkness.com slash overcoming. And again, a huge thanks to everybody who's already jumped in. It was a battered old book bound in red buckram. He found it when he was twelve years old on an upper shelf in his father's library, and against all the rules, he took it to his bedroom to read by candlelight. 
when the rest of the rambling Elizabethan house was flooded with darkness. That was how young Mortimer always thought of it. His own room was a little isolated cell in which, with stolen candle ends, he could keep the surrounding darkness at bay, while everyone else had surrendered to sleep and allowed the outer night to come flooding in. By contrast with those unconscious ones, his elders, it made him feel intensely alive in every nerve and fibre of his young brain. The ticking of the grandfather clock in the hall below, the beating of his own heart, the long-drawn rhythmical ah of the sea on the distant coast, all filled him with a sense of overwhelming mystery. And, as he read, the soft thud of a blinded moth striking the wall above the candle would make him start and listen like a creature of the woods at the sound of a cracking twig. The battered old book had the strangest fascination for him, though he never quite grasped the thread of the story. It was called The Midnight Express, and there was one illustration on the fiftieth page at which he could never bear to look. It frightened him. Young Mortimer never understood the effect of that picture on him. He was an imaginative but not neurotic youngster, and he avoided that fiftieth page as he might have hurried past a dark corner on the stairs when he was six years old, or as the grown man on the lonely road in the ancient mariner, who, having once looked round, walks on and turns no more his head. There was nothing in the picture, apparently, to account for this haunting dread. Darkness, indeed, was almost its chief characteristic. It showed an empty railway platform, at night lit by a single dreary lamp, an empty railway platform that suggested a deserted and lonely junction in some remote part of the country. There was only one figure on the platform, the dark figure of a man, standing almost directly under the lamp, with his face turned away toward the black mouth of a tunnel, which, for some strange reason, plunged the imagination of the child into a pit of horror. The man seemed to be listening. His attitude was tense, expectant, as though he were awaiting some fearful tragedy. There was nothing in the text so far as the child could read and could understand to account for this waking nightmare. He could neither resist the fascination of the book nor face that picture in the stillness and loneliness of the night. He pinned it down to the page facing it with two large pins so that he should not come upon it by accident. Then he determined to read the whole story through. But always before he came to page 50 he fell asleep and the outlines of what he had read were blurred and the next night he had to begin again and again before he came to the 50th page he fell asleep. He grew up and forgot all about the book and the picture. But halfway through his life, at that strange and critical time when Dante entered the dark wood, leaving the direct path behind him, he found himself, a little before midnight, waiting for a train at a lonely junction. And, as the station clock began to strike twelve, he remembered. Remembered like a man waking from a long dream. There, under the single dreary lamp on the long glimmering platform was the dark and solitary figure that he knew. Its face was turned away from him toward the black mouth of the tunnel. It seemed to be listening, tense, expectant, just as it had been thirty-eight years ago. But he was not frightened now as he had been in childhood. He would go up to that solitary figure, confront it, and see the face that had so long been hidden, so long averted from him. He would walk up quietly, and make some excuse for talking to it. He would ask it, for instance, if the train was going to be late. It should be easy for a grown man to do this. But his hands were clenched when he took the first step, as if he too were tense and expectant. Quietly, but with the old vague instincts awakening, he went toward the dark figure under the lamp, passed it, swung round abruptly to speak to it, and saw, without speaking, without being able to speak. It was himself staring back, 
as in some mocking mirror, his own eyes alive in his own white face. Looking into his own eyes, alive. The nerves of his heart tingled as though their own electric currents would paralyze it. A wave of panic went through him. He turned, gasped, stumbled, broke into a blind run, out through the deserted and echoing ticket office, onto the long moonlit road behind the station. The whole countryside seemed to be utterly deserted. The moonbeams flooded it with the loneliness of their own deserted satellite. He paused for a moment and heard, like the echo of his own footsteps, the stumbling run of something that followed over the wooden floor within the ticket office. Then he abandoned himself shamelessly to his fear and ran, sweating like a terrified beast, down the long white road between the two endless lines of ghostly poplars, each answering another, into what seemed an infinite distance. On each side of the road there was a long, straight canal in which one of the lines of poplars was again endlessly reflected. He heard the footsteps echoing behind him. They seemed to be slowly but steadily gaining upon him. A quarter of a mile away, he saw a small white cottage by the roadside, a white cottage with two dark windows and a door that somehow suggested a human face. He thought to himself that if he could reach it in time, he might find shelter and security, escape. The thin, implacable footsteps echoing his own were still some way off, when he lurched, gasping, into the little porch, rattled the latch, thrust at the door, and found it locked against him. There was no bell or knocker. He pounded on the wood with his fists until his knuckles bled. The response was horribly slow. At last, he heard heavier footsteps within the cottage. Slowly, they descended the creaking stair. Slowly, the door was unlocked. A tall, shadowy figure stood before him, holding a lighted candle in such a way that he could see little either of the holder's face or form. But to his dumb horror, there seemed to be a cerecloth wrapped around the face. No words passed between them. The figure beckoned him in. As he obeyed, it locked the door behind him. Then, beckoning him again without a word, the figure went before him up the crooked stair, with the ghostly candle casting huge and grotesque shadows on the whitewashed walls and ceiling. They entered an upper room in which there was a bright fire burning with an armchair on either side of it and a small oak table on which there lay a battered old book bound in dark red buckram. It seemed as though the guest had been long expected and all things were prepared. The figure pointed to one of the armchairs, placed the candlestick on the table by the book, for there was no other light but that of the fire, and withdrew without a word, locking the door behind him. Mortimer looked at the candlestick. It seemed familiar. The smell of the guttering wax brought back the little room in the old Elizabethan house. He picked up the book with trembling fingers. He recognized it at once, though he had long forgotten anything about the story. He remembered the ink stain on the title page, and then, with a shock of recollection, he came on the fiftieth page, which he had pinned down in childhood. The pins were still there. He touched them again, the very pins which his trembling, childish fingers had used so long ago. He turned now to the beginning, he was determined to read it to the end now and discover what it was all about. He felt that it must all be set down there in print, and though in childhood he could not understand it, he would be able to fathom it now. It was called The Midnight Express, and as he read the first paragraph, it began to dawn upon him slowly, fearfully, inevitably, it was the story of a man who in childhood long ago had chanced upon a book in which there was a picture that frightened him. He had grown up and forgotten it, and one night upon a lonely railway platform he had found himself in the remembered scene of that picture. He had confronted the solitary figure under the lamp, recognized it, and fled in panic. He had taken shelter in a wayside cottage and had been led to an upper room, found the book awaiting him, 
and had begun to read it right through to the very end at last. And this book, too, was called The Midnight Express, and it was the story of a man who in childhood... It would go on forever and forever and forever. There was no escape. But when the story came to the wayside cottage for the third time, a deeper suspicion began to dawn upon him. Slowly, fearfully, inevitably. Although there was no escape, he could at least try to grasp more clearly the details of the strange circle, the fearful wheel in which he was moving. There was nothing new about the details. They had been there all the time, but he had not grasped their significance. That was all. The strange and dreadful being that had led him up the crooked stair. Who and what was that? The story mentioned something else that had escaped him. The strange host who had given him shelter was about his own height. Could it be that he also... And was this why the face was hidden? At the very moment when he asked himself that question, he heard the click of the key in the locked door. The strange host was entering, moving toward him from behind, casting a grotesque shadow larger than human on the white walls in the guttering candlelight. It was there, seated on the other side of the fire facing him, with a horrible nonchalance as a woman might prepare to remove a veil. It raised its hands to unwind the sear cloth from its face. He knew to whom it would belong, but would it be dead or living? There was no way but one. As Mortimer plunged forward and seized the tormentor by the throat, his own throat was gripped with the same brutal force. The echoes of their strangled cry were indistinguishable. And when the last confused sounds died out together, the stillness of the room was so deep that you might have heard the ticking of the old grandfather clock and the long-drawn rhythmical of the sea on a distant coast 38 years ago. But Mortimer had escaped at last. Perhaps after all, he had caught the Midnight Express. It was a battered old book bound in red buckram. Joss Ackland was reading Midnight Express by Alfred Noyes. It was abridged and produced by Richard Dunn. You've been hearing me tell you the past few days about how I'm on a film set for a horror movie right now. If you've ever done something like that, you know it's early morning call times, late night shoots, and then doing it again the next day and the next without a break. I used to rely on energy drinks to get me through those long days, but while it kept me awake, I was not actually feeling alert and energized. And it was a ton of empty calories with zero health benefits. Fortunately, I have Magic Mind mental performance shots now, giving me natural energy and focus. I found that taking mine around noon each day keeps me focused and motivated throughout the afternoon and evening. I don't have the caffeine crash either, so I don't need that afternoon nap anymore, which is something you cannot do on a movie set. That would probably be frowned upon by the director. As a Weird Darkness listener, you can get a huge discount on your subscription of Magic Mind mental performance shots, 48% off. Just visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get the deal. If you want to try it without a subscription, you still get a great deal with 20% off your one-time purchase. I've made Magic Mind part of my daily routine, and now it's part of my movie-making routine. magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get 48% off your subscription or 20% off your one-time purchase. MagicMind.com slash Weird Darkness, promo code DARKNESS20. Uh, I wonder if we should put a special thanks in the movie credits for Magic Mind. This movie made possible by Magic Mind, because Darren would be too exhausted otherwise. Huh. Well, maybe. The Green Hornet. He 
hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies that even the G-men cannot reach, the Green Hornet. There was a crooked man. The events and characters depicted in this drama are fictitious. Any similarity to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Aboard the eastbound transport plane. I hope the next time they hold a newspaper convention, it'll be a little nearer home. At any rate, Britt, we're lucky to have been on the same plane. Hope you got as much out of your convention as I got out of my trip to Chicago. Oh, which reminds me, Conway, uh, why did you go to Chicago? Why? Well, when James Conway, a one-man grand jury investigating Graf, leaves for an airplane trip, that's news. That's what I'm afraid of. I'd as soon rather not have it known that I went to Chicago. Or hope you won't publicize it. The simplest way to keep things out of the paper, Conway, is to confide in a newspaper man. If he thinks you're trying to hide something and put one over on him, he'll get answers and publish them. Frankly, then, I went there in connection with the graft problem. I assumed as much. There were a couple of men doing a term in Joliet. I had enough on them to make sure of another rap when they finished this one. So they were glad to talk to me. You uh, wouldn't resort to blackmail to get facts, would you? <laughs> Brett, in smashing this graft ring, I'd resort to practically anything. Bad as that. Worse than anyone realizes. Right here in this briefcase... I hold the data that will smash this ring. How about some advance information? Well, I might make a deal with you. Eh? You want information to get what you call a scoop for your paper. I'd like to have the Daily Sentinel be the first to announce what you will reveal. And you'll have your scoop. If. What's the if, Conway? If you let me have everything in your possession pertaining to the Green Hornet. What? The Green Hornet. But, Conway, uh, what makes you think the Daily Sentinel has anything about him? Perhaps you haven't. In that case, I'll get the worst of the bargain. On the other hand, perhaps you have. I'll have to rely entirely on your word of honor. I see. I'll promise you a scoop on my expose when I'm ready to break it. Provided you give me your word of honor to tell me all you know about the Green Hornet. Well, I... uh, My word of honor? Precisely. Let uh, let me think this proposition over, Conway. Think it over. Then you do know more about it than the police have announced. I'm not committing myself just yet. Oh, by the way, I must send a radiogram to the paper to have my valet meet me at the field. Well, that won't be necessary. My daughter Polly will be there. Oh, but I don't want... She'll have her car to meet me. We can drop you any place you say. Well, if it won't put you out, uh, you can drop me at my office. Not at all, Reed. Glad to. Meanwhile, at the airport, Ed Lowry of the Sentinel approached a sport roadster. Say, you're Polly Conway, right? What? Why, yes. My name's Lowry of the Sentinel. Waiting for the Chicago plane? Yes. By uh, any chance, are you waiting for your father? How did you know who I was? <laughs> Those low license plates are a dead giveaway, Miss Conway. Oh. 
Heard your old man... Uh, your father was digging up some facts in the Midwest. I'm sure I wouldn't know. How soon is the plane due to land? Mm, half hour. Um, are you here to meet father, too? Me? No. No, I'm just here scouting for news. You know, sometimes big names come in on the planes. Oh. My boss was in Chicago, too. wonder if you met your father there. Mr. Reed? Yeah, know him? Indeed, yes, very well. Say, that's one nasty mess we're having in this town, isn't it, Miss Conway? I, uh... I wonder how your father's investigation is going. I'm sorry, Mr. Lowry, I... <laughs> if anyone can smash this grab ring, he's the man to do it. You really think so? He's told you about it, of course. Well, he... A couple dozen gambling houses running wide open with all kinds of protection. Cheap joints where they let a sucker play for a nickel and others where they let them do anything to limit, win or lose. Yeah, really, I... Oh, Miss Conway, he must have mentioned them to you. Well, if he has, I've paid little attention. The I... sheriff of the county attempts a raid once in a while, but there's always a tip-off. Is there? Yes. Yet the same sheriff completely smashes the joints that try to open in competition to Deke Slotkin. Say, what's your father said about Deke Slotkin? Now, there's a crook who's in solid... Wonder how much he pays for protection. If you're trying to get information out of me. me you... <laughs> no, where'd you get that idea? I'll bet Dick Slotkin has tried to approach your father, hasn't he? Miss Conway? Oh, yes. Wire just came to the office for you. Thank you. From your father? Oh, really, Mr. Lowry, it's none of your good. Oh, Bad news? You missed the plane and we'll have to come by rail. I'm to meet up at the station later. I'll go with you. Oh, no, you won't. Wait, I'll tell you what. Let me check at the office and see the passenger list of that plane. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Lowry. It's nice to meet you. Now, lady, wait. Gosh, what a girl. Why do people have to turn right in the middle of the road? Can't you pull to the side and let me pass? Just a minute, lady. Oh, I didn't see. Put that gun down. What does this mean? Just keep your hands on the steering wheel, Miss Conway. There. I'm riding with you, and you go where I tell you. How dare you? Get out of my car. What's now, the meaning? Take it easy, and you won't be hurt. Okay, boys. Pull the sign and let us by. You can't get away with this. Turn left at the next side road. Why, you... Do as I say. The next morning in the office of the Daily Sentinel. Holy mackerel, if this don't beat the Chinese. Hey, where's Gunnigan? Lunch. Lunch. I thought a city editor lived on ink and paper. Lunch. With a story like this, he's eating. Gangway, I gotta see the boss. What's the matter with you, Lowry? Deep slapped and smacked the homer with the bases loaded. Good grief, Lowry. Easy on that door. Where's the boss? Where's Reed? What do you want him for? He's busy. Yeah? Well, tell him that Deke Slotkin's finally found enough cash to bribe James Conway. Watch yourself, Lowry. That's one of those things that calls for lots of proof. You said it, Casey. And what I'd give to be the guy to prove it. What's the matter, Lowry? Get a load of this, boss. Conway reports that he couldn't find a thing against Deke Slotkin, the sheriff, or anyone else in the gambling ring. What? Here's his statement. It just came in. Oh, but that's impossible. It's a lot of bunk. He had plenty of stuff before he went to Chicago. How do you know he went to Chicago? Don't ask me. I know, that's all. That trip was kept secret. A guy in Conway's spot conducting a grand jury investigation don't have any secrets. Besides, I was at the airport yesterday. His daughter Polly was there. Oh, she was? Yeah, I tried to get some information from her, but <laughs> she was too smart. She wasn't there when the plane landed. No, her father didn't come by plane. She got a wire to meet him at the central station. He came by train. Hey, wait a minute, Laura. Let's get this straight. You say Conway wired that he'd not be on that plane? Sure, then his daughter drove away. And you say that he did have enough charges against the Slotkin crowd before he went to Chicago? Yeah, and he must have got something in Chicago. Now he comes back and says he has no evidence. Hands in a report that the sheriff and the stooges are perfectly okay. Says Deke Slotkin is on the level. And we know darn well this county reeks with grass. But Lowry. Yeah? James Conway was on that plane. He was? Well, certainly. I talked with him all the way from Chicago. Why did he send that wire? Why didn't he have his daughter stay there? Miss Case, get Conway on the phone. Very well. If he isn't in his office, try his home. If he's not there, try the Civic Club. Right. Laura, you get on the trail of Deke Slotkin. Me? Right. Yeah, James have Slade cover the sheriff's office. Get Parker and Milray and have them cover some of Slotkin's joints tonight and see how they're doing. They'll know whether or not the gambling is running full blast. And if it is? Well, no Slotkin's mob feels perfectly safe. I get it. The last two weeks, they've had a soft pedal on. Get going. Don't worry, I'm on my way. No! Oh! Sorry, oh, okay. buddy, I didn't see you come. James Conway. Conway, the very man I want to see. Come in. Oh, I was just calling Say, Mr. Conway, I want to talk to you. On your way, Lowry. This doesn't change instructions as far as you're concerned. Oh, how do you... 
Britt, I want to speak to you. There's no one I'd sooner see. Privately, if you please. Oh, come on in my office. Miss Case, if those other men Lowry's going to call for me should come in for orders, have them wait. Yes, Mr. Reed. Well, there we are. Sit down, Conway. One of my reporters uh, brought in some news about you. Yes, yes, I know they did. All the papers have it. I couldn't do anything else. I had to issue that statement. And that you made no findings whatever against the gambling graph? Yes, Reed, I... I had no choice. What's uh, behind this, Conway? Reed, there's just one man who knows I did have information. Oh, I knew it. You told me as much on the plane yesterday. That's why I'm here today. To ask, to beg you, Reed, to forget everything I said yesterday. Why? Please, please don't ask any questions. Will you do as I ask? That's a large order, Conway. I know. You told me yesterday you were ready to smash the gambling ring in this county. You said you got enough information in Chicago to expose the sheriff and his crooked deputies. You guaranteed to prove that Deke Slotkin could run his gambling houses wide open because he was paying plenty for protection. I know. I wish I'd bitten my tongue off before I said that. Uh, what's happened since then? I can't tell you. I can't tell anyone. Conway, I told you yesterday that you could trust a newspaper man. This is different. I also told you that if you tried to put one over on a newspaper man, he'd go a long way to get to the bottom of things. I, I know, Reed. But this, well, you can't get to the bottom of this. Where's your daughter, Conway? Uh, what? You heard me. Where's your daughter, Polly? Why, uh, she, uh, that is, she's out of town. Are you sure she's out of town? What are you driving at, Reed? Just this, Conway. Your daughter went to meet you at the airport yesterday. Someone sent her a telegram. She drove away from the airport. Has anyone seen her since then? Good Lord, how do you know these Has things? Has she been taken by Slotkin's mob? Reed, I... Are they holding her? Do they demand that you surrender all the evidence against them as the price for her safety? You, you seem to know. Conway, uh, what are you going to do about it? I have no choice, Reed. Are you going to let a gang of crooks get away with... Reed, for 20 years I've served the public. Worked for the interests of the people. When Matterling ran for the office of sheriff, I fought against his election. He was elected through no fault of mine. Well, you needn't tell me, Conway. I fought with you. As soon as Matterling took office, he started this tie-up with Slotkin. To correct the mistake the voters made, I kept after him. I did have a case against him. I meant to expose him. But now I can't read. I'll give everything I've got in public service, except my daughter. No matter how much I may want to expose this gambling ring, my daughter's safety comes first. Even though you know who captured her, you can't do anything about it. How can I? Any one of dozens of underworld rats could have handled this abduction. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. And there's no way to force those behind it to admit their connections. How are you advised what to do? They called me on the phone. Have you destroyed the evidence? No. Handed it over to them? I, I will do so. But you haven't done it yet. I I can't say any more, Britt. I came here simply to ask you to forget what I said yesterday. Where is that evidence now? Britt, I can't say any more. Will you do what I've asked? You may count on me, Conway. I knew I could. <laughs> Later, in Britt Reed's apartment, the young publisher spoke to Cato, his faithful valet, and the only living person to know him as the Green Hornet. Cato, we're going out tonight. We're going to see what we can do. Very well, Mr. Britt. I wondered, Cato, just how I could give Conway all the information I had about the Green Hornet. No, you're not have to. No, Cato, I won't have to. His daughter's disappearance makes it unnecessary to keep that bargain with Conway. Still... I'd almost prefer telling him the whole story if it were the only way to smash this gambling ring. Mr. Conway's a smart man. Conway's very smart, Cato. He's told no one else about his daughter's abduction. I'm the only one. Then you must be careful, sir. You're right. If the Hornet should show a knowledge of his daughter's abduction, Conway will know Britt Reed is the Green Hornet. Unless... Unless what, Mr. Reed? Unless Conway is made to believe that the Green Hornet is one of the abductors. Come, Cato. The mask and the weapon. Tonight, Conway is going to meet the Green Hornet. The curtain falls on the first act of our Green Hornet adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
To continue our story, the only way Britt Reed could offer aid as the Green Hornet without making James Conway suspect his true identity was to pose as a member of the gang that had kidnapped Conway's daughter. With this as his plan, he guided the sleek black beauty to the court outside Conway's study. Wait here in the car, Cato. Yes, Mr. Britt. I'll go through that French window. Conway's in his study. Farewell. Back inside. Matt. In Conway. We'll talk inside the study. The, the Green Hornet. I guess you know why I'm here, don't you? I I can imagine. Why? You and those other rats are after the portfolio. Well, right? where is it? I thought there'd be a phone call. I've been waiting for it. I'm here. There's no need for the phone call. But if I give you what you want, how do I know my daughter will return safely? You'll have to take your chances on that. If she's seen any of you, you, you might not let her go free to testify. She certainly won't go free if you don't stop stalling. Hand over those affidavits. But Be I, quick about it. I, yes, I, I have them. I'll get them. Now you, put your hands up. Why you? Hurry. Raise your hands or I'll blast you into eternity. More nerve than I gave you credit for, Conway. Take off that mask. Conway, do you know what this will mean to your daughter? I know that I'm about to learn the identity of the Green Hornet. After that, I'll dictate the terms. You'll send my daughter back, not to save the gambling ring but to protect yourself. My silence in exchange for my daughter's life. Don't be a fool, Conway. You can't help your daughter this way. Take off that mask. I... <coughs> Take it. There's something's wrong. My throat. Oh. Too bad, Conway. You forgot I might have an assistant. I saw him. Shot gas in the window just in time. I'll get in here quickly. We've got to find those papers. They must be in here somewhere. He was waiting for a phone call from the gang. We'd better hurry. He started for this drawer. Perhaps. Yeah, here's a portfolio. Is that the one? Yes. Yes. Well, this evidence is enough to send Sheriff Madeline, three of his deputies, and the entire gambling ring to jail for life. He had them, eh? And on top of that, they have a kidnapping charge to face. Huh. Conway said he was waiting for a phone call. Yes, sir. It was to tell him how to go about exchanging these papers for his daughter. Well, we'll stay right here and take that call. In a large suburban home where Polly Conway was held captive, Deke Slotkin made his phone call. The girl... Well, Conway, you'll just have to take our word for it that she's safe. Yes. Yes, of course you can talk to her. Bring the dame over here. Go ahead, sister. Talk into that phone. Oh, you cowardly... Never mind the names. Your father's on the other end of this phone. Say something. Dad, don't pay any attention to them. That's enough. Don't listen to them, Dad. Come on, come on. You heard the boss. Hello, Conway. Don't try to trace this call, because we ain't calling from the place you'll find us at when you bring the stuff, see? Matter of fact, I'll tell you where we're calling from. It's your own house in the country. <laughs> All right, you mugs. Take the girl out to the car. Get her to the next place. I told Conway to meet us there. You think he'll bring the stuff with him? Sure he will. Sure. You'll be sorry for this. My father will let you get away with it. Take her out and get started. We'll come in the car. Come on, let's get going. Deke. Yes, Steve? The dame's seen us all. We don't dare let her go. No? She'll squawk. She'll send us all to the gaol for life. Who said anything about letting her go? On the other hand, if we don't let her go, Conway knows who'll be doing her in. It's all worked out, Steve. We got the girl's car parked at the 7-Eleven Club. Yeah? Conway comes there with the evidence and leaves with the girl. Sure, but... On the way back to town, they cross the Battlestone Bridge. 
And that's where they have an accident. And get this, Steve. You know how it's going to look like this accident happened? I'm listening. It's going to look like you come out here with his daughter. They had a couple of drinks, a couple too many, get it? And Conway's too tight to drive his car, so he goes off the bridge. Boy, that's a lulu. Yeah, and six of you guys will swear the girl was at the club. Come on, now, we got to get to the 7-Eleven club before Conway does. Tell the boys to watch for his car in the parking lot. Right. Conway is one guy that couldn't be reached with cash. Well, we'll reach him this way. Permanently, Steve. Permanently. <laughs> When James Conway recovered consciousness... Uh, what? The hornet. The green hornet. Uh, gas. I remember. Gas. Knocked me out. <laughs> Weak as a kitten. Here, hear the desk drawer. The papers. Papers gone. The hornet. Oh, yeah. The phone. I'll show him. He, he can't bluff me. Hello. Give me police headquarters. Hmm. What's, what's this? Drop something. A dress. Good Lord. Hello. Police headquarters. James Conway speaking. I just found a clue to the Green Hornet. Yes. Send Sergeant Doyle here with men he can pick out and trust. I know he's on the level. Warrant nothing. We're going to raid the 7-Eleven and do it without a tip-off. We don't need warrants where the Green Hornet is concerned. Cato, hey, these papers tell all about the 7-Eleven Club. Now, there's a secret entrance to Deke Slotkin's office. How much is required for protection? That is good. If only Conway is the fighter he proved to be when I was in his home. If he is not, Mr. Bitt. If he isn't, Cato, I don't know what will happen might mean the end of the Green Hornet. Our luck must make James Conway realize what the note I dropped in his office meant. It must give him added courage enough to act on it. More, Mr. Red. More? What do you mean more? You must get out of the club. Yes, yeah, that's a problem, kid. Once inside the 7-Eleven club, how am I going to get out? There's a club just ahead. Now to find that secret entrance. According to the information in the portfolio, that entrance to Deke Slotkin's office must be through that little woodshed. Yes, Mr. Red. Well, that's the way I'm going in. Take the car, Cato, and leave me here. But, Mr. Bitt, how do you get away? I don't know yet, Cato, but don't bother about me. You get this car back to the hiding place. There's nothing more you can do. Holly Conway, her hands still tied, was in Slotkin's office. Better put a gag on it, too, Steve. Okay, boss. Whatever you say. Yes, you'd better, you pack of yellow rats. Four of you here, and you're afraid of one girl. Shut up. Take it easy. Get a gag in her mouth and get outside. Watch for Conway's car. Who's that? I wouldn't know, boss. Who knows about the secret door to this place? You got me, Deke. Must be one of the bunch. The only one of the bunch that knows about that isn't here. He's in stir in Chicago. Maybe he's out. No, he isn't out. If he was, we'd have heard of it before this. Say, do you suppose Conway knows about that? Maybe he does. Should I open it? Yeah, open it up. All of you, stand where you are. Hey, what's that? The Hornet! What the Samuel? Move back in there. Hey, what's all that smoke behind you? The behind me has been filled with gas. You better close that panel if you don't want it to come into this office. I'll close it. What's a big idea? Who sent you? I'm here representing Conway. Close that panel. That means no one will leave by this exit, Slotkin. Did Conway send you here? What do you think? I'm here to take the girl and leave these papers. Hold on. That stuff don't go, understand? Oh, you figure on stopping me, Slotkin? Now, Hornet, put down the rod. We can get together. Untie that girl. Hurry it up. I'm taking her out of here with me. And just how do you figure on getting her out, Hornet? You think you can walk right through that crowd in the gambling rooms here with a Hornet mask gun without nobody stopping I you? I said I'm tired. Guess again, fellow. I'll shake it down. Yes, you fool. If anyone else wants some gas, just make a play for a gun. Are you going to untie that girl or will I have to gas the bunch of you into it myself? Take the ropes off of Steve. He can't get out of here. Okay. Conway thought you wouldn't be dependent on to keep your word. He kept his. 
papers. Say, here are the papers. All the evidence you got against you. Yeah, let me look at them. Now remove that gag. All right, all right. I'm doing it. <laughs> I suppose you think you're smart finding that secret entrance. Well, let me tell you, Hornet, you haven't a chance in the world of getting out of here. That's the cops. The signal. It's a raid. We didn't get a tip. Don't try to watch that door. We got a scram. Help, help. Boss, the dame. Them papers, if they catch us... They will find your hair. See how you like this gas. There's enough in that bomb to fill the room, and here's some more. Now to get out of here. Across the corner. Yeah, that's room there. Come on, men. Lock private officers this way. I'm right with you, Conway. Get back there. Here's one raid to work tip top. Here's the office. The door is open. Conway, why didn't you tell me you were going to raid the Please. You here? It looks that way, huh? Holy smoke, boss. But, well, you can't be here finding a raid. I was after information. Stay with us, Reed. My daughter is here somewhere. The Hornet's here, too. The Hornet? Yeah, he tried to threaten Conway. He's in with a gang. You stick with us, boss. Make out you made the raid along with us. Oh, there's my daughter. Polly. Polly, are you all right? This room's filled with gas. Careful how you enter it. What's this stuff? My evidence. The things the Hornet's told. Here's Ferber, Slotkin, and a couple of others. They're all cold. Polly, Polly, speak to me. Are you all right? I'm sure she's not harmed, Mr. Conway. The gas the Hornet uses is not dangerous. Mr. Reed, this will smash the ring. Look at the stuff that's here. I know. Uh, you know. Oh, look. Uh... Uh, Conway told me about it. I think, Conway, that now the Sentinel has a story. The Sentinel has. I wonder which of these four men is the Green Hornet. I doubt if any of them is. You seem to know a lot about the Green Hornet. You said the gas was not dangerous. You claim none of these is the Hornet. I uh, happen to know quite a bit about the Green Hornet. In in my position with the Sentinel, I've been well informed about him. That's right, Conway. There's only one guy that knows more about the Green Hornet than Britt Reed does. And that's the Green Hornet himself. (laughs) is a copyrighted feature of the Green Hornet Incorporated. Every October, we take the month and raise funds for organizations that help people who struggle with depression. It's called Overcoming the Darkness. AZ wrote in a few years ago talking about our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. I can tell everyone that no matter what you think, there is a way out of depression. And I'm living proof. I spent 30 plus years in a funk so deep, there are large chunks of my life I simply don't remember. At times, it was just a feeling of sadness and impending doom. I thought of ways out, many times. I finally got tired of barely being alive. I talked to a doctor and began taking antidepressants. Now I rarely get depressed or stressed, and I no longer find myself not dreading tomorrow. This is why our Overcoming the Darkness campaign is so important. It supports organizations that help people who struggle with depression so that they too can start looking forward to tomorrow instead of dreading today. 
please donate today, right now if you can. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Presenting Orson Welles as The Third Man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the motion picture The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man, yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. No. He had many lives. And I can tell you about all of them. How? Because my name is Harry Lyme. <laughs> And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, The Golden Fleece. Well, it's a queer story, no matter how you look at it. It begins with a bullfight. It ends with a naval engagement on the China Sea. There's a woman in it, of course. Have another drink? All right, if you are. Uh, Two gin slings, boy. Yes, sir. Two gin slings. It all started in the little seaport of Algeciras. Like every other town in Spain, there's a bull ring there. I don't know how you feel about bullfights, but if it's Sunday in Spain, it's a little hard to stay away from them. A bullfight is to Spain what an opera is to Italy. It's the only thing in the country that starts on time. I'd been dawdling over my shellfish and beer, so then I got into the second faena. Soldadito was in the ring. He was younger then and braver than he is now, but I've never been one of his fans. Too much ballet dancing for me and not enough bullfighting, but... We won't go into that. I could talk about the corrida all night, but I promised you a story about adventure on the high seas. And it's beginning right now. Soldadito is dedicating the bull. He is paying this compliment to the lady who is seated next to me. For the first time, I glance at her, and the glance freezes into a stare. She has very dark red hair, very pale ivory skin, and very bright yellow eyes. I mean, really yellow, like a cat's. I won't dwell on her. I'd like to, but I won't. Suffice to say that this kid could stop traffic on the Indianapolis Speedway. The bullfighter turns, tosses his hat to her in the classical gesture over the shoulder and moves out into the sunlight toward the bull. But as far as I'm concerned, the bullfight is over. You must watch the ring, senor. Hmm? I beg your pardon? It is very pleasant to feel your eyes upon me. I adore being stared at, but uh, just now, don't you think it's a bit disrespectful to our friend Soldadito? He's no friend of mine. He's a good friend of yours, senorita. Permit me to inform you that he is my enemy. He's very graceful, don't you think? Mm. And that was also a graceful speech, senor. No, I didn't hear it. I do not mean his dedication of the bull to me. No, I mean your little speech just now about his being your enemy if he's my friend. <laughs> Thanks. I adore it when men fight over me. Senorita, fighting over you would be a pleasure. Uh, when do I begin? Whenever you like. <laughs> Who shall I take on? The man or the bull? I think you need not bother about the bull. Look, Soldadito is about to make the kill. That was a beautiful kill, wasn't it, Mr... Uh, what is your name? Lime, Harry Lime. Yes, good kill. I will call you Harry. 
The bull kneeled like a penitent at his feet. The beast seemed to be asking the torero's pardon. Mm, it should have been the other way around. <laughs> you are already jealous. I adore that. <laughs> Still, you must admit it was a glorious kill. Yeah, great kill. Tell me, Harry, what are you doing in Algeria? No, I'm just looking around. And what are you looking for? Well, no need to look any longer. I found it. You make very pretty little speeches. I adore that. What is your profession? Oh, uh, export, uh, import, mostly. I, I dabble in a lot of things. What a pity. Why? I had allowed myself to hope you were a sailor. Well, I have been a sailor. Will that help? You have to have master's papers. I am here with my yacht. Perhaps you have seen it in the harbor. Oh, that big three-master with the black hole? It's mine. We've lost our captain. Oh? It happened quite suddenly. I'm very sorry you're not a ship's captain. I would like to see you in the blue jacket with the gold buttons. Would you believe it? I was a ship's captain. I do not believe it. But I have master's papers. And where are they? Oh, in Barcelona. Oh, that is a bore, because we are leaving tomorrow. Okay, I'll have somebody bring him down by train tonight. In other words, you want the job? In other words, I've got the job. I needed that job too much. And, of course, she knew it. I don't say she didn't like me, but there wasn't any doubt of it. That season, I was a little afraid about the seams. I phoned a friend of mine, a forger up in Barcelona, and made arrangements to cook up some papers for me and rush him down that night to the coast. Then I changed into my best shirt, the other one, and went to the best restaurant. She told me she was going there after the bullfight. Good evening. Good evening. I, I'm sorry, but I just realized something. I don't know your name. You, you do not know the lady's name. You know Soldadito. Of, of course she knows me. All Spain knows me. But what is this man doing at our table? He, he doesn't know you. That's all right, old man. You can fix that. Introduce us. I am the Baroness von Gernipalt. But you will call me Nadia. Okay, Nadia. The next morning, I had the forged papers and the captain's job safely in my pocket. Truth was, of course, that I'd never been a sailor in my life. Unless you count the work I had to do as a deckhand when they found me stowed away on a short trip from Alexandria to Naples. But I needed that job bad. After one look into those huge cat's yellow eyes of hers, I would have jumped at any job she offered, whether I needed it or not. You like the ship, Harry? <laughs> She's a beauty. The steward will take your luggage to your cabin. Right now, you'll be needed on deck to superintend our departure. Uh, by the way, where are we going? To China. Algeciras, Spain, to Hong Kong, China. That's quite a run for an old salt, whose only experience as a navigator consisted of piloting a canoe around the shallow end of Lake Winnebago, Wisconsin. Luckily, I thought to bring along a little help. The help's name, of all things in the world, was Sidney Carton. He was an ex-smuggler, rather an unemployed smuggler. I'd run into Sidney occasionally on various little capers in and around the Mediterranean, and I figured he was crooked enough so I could trust him. His main attraction, besides a shock of dirty, carrot-colored hair and a glass eye, was a set of teeth like a rotten rake. Sidney was the only man I ever knew who could eat a tomato through a zither. But if Sidney was an eyesore, he was a gift from heaven as far as Captain Lyme was concerned. He was a real sailor, remember, and he covered up for me doing all the real work while I walked around in my blue jacket with the gold buttons trying to look important. Naturally, Sidney wasn't doing this for love. But since I didn't have any money, I found it necessary to make him a few promises. I tell you, Sidney, this, this isn't a yacht at all. Of course it's a yacht, Harry. This is a pleasure trip, pure and simple, and there's nothing in it for us. I told you we were carrying contraband, old man, and I'll prove it. What kind of contraband? Dope? Don't be a fool, Harry. Nobody smuggles dope into China. We're going off around the world just for the fun of it, and that ain't any fun. Why had I been signed on with so few questions asked? Why had we left so quickly? Above all, what had happened to the original captain? <laughs> it was queer enough, all right. But I was not telling Sidney the truth when I claimed that this was not a pleasure cruise. It was a pleasure, believe me. Then, one night, quite late it must have been, because I remember the moon was down. I was up on deck finishing a cigarette. Harry. Hmm? Harry. You still up, old man? I want to talk to you, Eddie. Why don't you get some sleep, old man? 
I found After all, it, Daddy. That... You found it? What did you find? The contraband. Under the floorboards. I know what we're carrying now, Harry, and it had knock your eye out. Amazing. That's what it is, amazing. Okay, old man, okay. Spill it. Oh, I've got a whole lot to spill, Harry. A whole lot. Maybe I ought to begin with the explosives. Explosives? Very powerful they are, Harry. Enough to blow this ship to China. So that's it. Oh, no. No, that's not the contraband. But let me ask you this, Harry. Did you ever notice that glass box in the chart house with a sign over it that says emergency? Only? Hold it a minute. Oh, what's wrong? I thought I heard something. Go on, go on. And I also found out about the captain, Harry. Hmm? Do you know who he was? Take it one thing at a time, old man, please. He was a naval officer for Hitler. Oh, very high and mighty mucky mucky in the Nazi Navy he was. And you know his name? Well, what's his name got to do with it? I want to know what was happening. I'm coming to that. But the captain's name, Harry, was von Koenigwald. Von Koenigwald, but that's not just... Right, the... Harry. He was her husband. And this is a rum go if ever I've seen one. Now, you take the explosives. You take them. What I want to hear is you about... You can't laugh it off, Harry. Try as you will, it just ain't funny. These explosives are all wired up and set to go, Harry. This isn't a ship. It's a bomb. Shh. And as for what we're smuggling... Shut up. There is somebody listening. Stay there. I'll be back in a second. Right. Hello. Hello, Nadia. It's too hot to sleep, isn't it? Hmm. It's pretty hot, all right. Keep me company, Harry. I'm lonely. <laughs> When I finally got to my own cabin, it was dawn. Didn't dare go looking for Sydney in any way. I was bone tired. They couldn't have let me sleep for more than an hour. Yes. Yes, what is it? It's Matthew, sir, third officer. And what do you want? Well, sir, we're in sight of land and the old course. Don't bother me. Ask Sydney. He knows the course. Yes, sir. but please, Captain, may I speak to you? Okay, okay. Now then, what is it? It's cotton I want to talk to you about, sir. Well, what's wrong? Well, I hardly know how to tell you, sir, but he's gone. Gone? Yes, sir. We've searched everywhere, very thoroughly, but there's no doubt at all, sir. Mr. Carton is not on this ship. Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man. And now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with today's story, The Golden Fleece. <laughs> I still don't know how, how we made it into port. The trick was to keep that second mate from guessing that I couldn't tell the poop from a bosun's whistle. And also to keep all of us from crashing into a reef or turning upside down or something. Luckily, a little boat came out to meet us with the harbor pilot. Seems that's the regular procedure. I was very grateful, I can tell you, to be spared the embarrassment of having to swim for it. But it's a long haul from Hong Kong, China to Panama City, and much as I like Nadia's company, I think I would have quit the job if I hadn't managed to make a deal with young Matthews, the second mate. I showed him some papers I happened to have, proving I was a secret operative from the FBI and explained that he had to cover up for me the way Carton had been doing before. And by the time we got out of the canal on the Pacific end... I had everything pretty much under control. Would you like another drink? Uh, no, thanks. Please go on, Mr... Uh... Uh, Lime, Harry Lime. Uh, you see, I've got a reason for spinning this yarn. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, what happened to Carton? Well, uh, Sydney? <laughs> Nobody ever saw him again. Now, I'll skip the Pacific crossing now because nothing very important happened to us until we got to China. Unless you'd like to hear some more about those yellow eyes at night. Uh, what happened to von Koenigwald, the lady's husband? I'm coming to that, old man. Uh, just a second till I finish the drink. Okay. 
Well, it was late in March when we sighted Hong Kong. I'd learned how to imitate a sea captain by then, but I was more than a little anxious about my papers. It had been a nasty moment or two in Tahiti, and I was afraid the British authorities might spot the forgery. They might even have gotten some wireless message about me by then, but I still didn't know the purpose of the trip, you understand. Sydney hadn't gotten around to telling me about what the contraband was before he disappeared. So my curiosity got the better of me as usual, and I stayed with the ship. Captain, there's a speedboat coming alongside on the port bow. It can't be the pilot. We've already taken him on. Could be the harbor police, sir. Eh, uh, isn't good. Oh, no, the speedboat is mine. Oh? You all bring the ship into anchorage, Mr. Matthews, please. The captain and I are leaving now. We are? Where are we going, honey? I loathe that expression. Okay, not yet, but you have to answer my question. There'll be plenty of time for that on the way. <laughs> We'd been riding upriver from Hong Kong for a good half hour before Nadia took it into her beautiful head to start talking. I'm taking you to meet a very important man, Harry. Huh? You'd better know his name. It's General Wei. A Chinaman? He is Chinese, yes. General Wei was governor of one of the largest southern provinces, but of course that was... Where are we meeting him? I think the mainland would be too hot for him now. The general will be waiting for us on the junk. A what? A Chinese boat. I hope you're hungry because there's bound to be quite a feast. You mean to say we've come halfway around the world to keep a dinner engagement with a Chinese warlord? Ours has been a very serious mission, Harry. And before you meet the general, I think you should know the truth. So do I. The general is planning to retrieve the lost provinces. Luckily, he is a wealthy man and had many investments in Tangier. It was my mission to bring him some of his wealth, which will be needed in the coming war. I think you have guessed what happened to the Baron von Königwald. Yes, I think so. I think... I think the Baron had a wife. I think his wife bumped him off. Am I right, honey? Please call me Nadia. Okay, I think Nadia bumped him off. He was a greedy man. I had reason to suspect that he planned to take part of the gold for himself. Gold? Yes, Harry. Gold bars purchased in Tangier. That's why I couldn't tell you earlier... It would have been too much of a temptation. The ship is lined with gold. Half a million dollars worth. You know those Chinese ships? You know, the ones that look like some kind of cross between a Spanish galleon and a floating chop suey store? Well, pretty soon we came out to the biggest and gaudiest on the river. We were helped on board with a whole lot of oriental fanfare, and I gathered that in a minute we were going to be presented to his nibs, the warlord himself. Uh, Nadia. Yes? There's just one thing I don't understand. No matter what price the old boy pays for that gold you brought him, I, I can't see why you bothered to cart it all the way across the Pacific. If you just told me before, I could have made a very nice deal for you in Mexico. I did not bring the gold here for the profit, Harry. Here he comes. Nadia, a thousand welcomes. Welcome to you, great one. All my gratitude. This is General Way, Mr. Harry Lyme. Harry, may I present my father? I know you've heard about shark's fins and bird's nest soup, but I'll bet you never knew a Chinese banquet can last seven and a half hours. Well, this one did, with eating all the way. May I offer you some more ice wine, Captain Lyme? Well, I'm afraid I've had too much already, General. Uh, I know this may sound a little rude, but I kind of wondering, is... Is Nadia really your daughter? She is my only child. That's funny, she doesn't look very Chinese. No, Nadia's mother was a white Russian refugee. I met her in Chi Fu and made the mistake of marrying her. Nadia, however, is no mistake. She is my very precious jewel, Mr. Lyme. And I thank you for taking such good care of her. Father, father, it's gone. It's got... Get the speedboat! What's happened? What's the happened? Boat, Harry, our boat with all the gold on it. It has vanished. While we were in there stuffing ourselves, somebody had made off with a yacht. Word came to us it was going downstream toward the open sea. It's my fault. Well, why yours, Nadia? That Matthews boy, the third mate, I should never have trusted him. I should never trust anybody. But if you'd gone on stabbing your ship's officers and tossing him overboard, you'd have ended up without any crew. There she is, ahead of us. Ahoy there, golden fleece! Come about and prepare to receive us on board! Can't you get any more speed, Harry? Well, I'm punching a hole in the floor as it is. Ahoy, golden fleece! 
This is your last chance. Come about or we open fire. They won't answer. They will now. Fire! We had a dangerous looking gang of hatchet men with machine guns on our launch, and they put up a good show. It wasn't long before we were next to the yacht, and I could see the lot of damage had been done to the crew on board. It wasn't my crew, it was strangers. Chinese. We'll just have to storm over the side. Come on, Harry. <laughs> What's wrong, General? Are you hit? That's all right, Captain. Just give me your arm. Okay. Uh, Here we go. sooner were we on deck than a mean-looking Mongol I hadn't noticed before. High up in the shrouds, bit off the end of a grenade and threw it smack into our launch. Well, there goes everybody on our side. I guess this is it, Nadia. Yes, Nadia, this is it. Hey, wait a minute. Don't worry, Nadia, I am not a ghost. Wait a minute, you're Nadia's husband. Yes, happily for me, I was not as dead as she thought I was when she pushed me into the sea. You should have remembered, I am a good swimmer. Keep your hands in the air, please, all three of you. Hans, how did you get here? By plane? I couldn't guess your cause, and it was the easiest way. I just flew to Hong Kong and waited for... And now what are you going to do? I am going to do unto others as they would do unto me, Captain. If you happen to remember any prayers, you would better start saying them, all three of you. I am wounded, Kennifelt, and dying. It doesn't matter about me, but Nadia's... Father, I'm your no. true child. Do you imagine I would leave you now? This is all very nice and noble, but what about me? That's true, Harry. Hans, this man has done nothing to harm you. Let him swim for he it. He knows about the gold, Nadia, and I prefer to keep that as my own secret. He also knows about something else, don't you, Harry? Carlton told me about it the night I killed him. What do you him. mean? There's a tiny glass window here by my hand. Carlton explained it to you. I heard him. The sign says for emergency only. Yes? Remember what he said, Harry. This isn't a ship. It's a bomb. Thanks, Nadia. God bless you. Shoot that man! Yet no you can. He's a good swimmer, too. Goodbye, Harry. <laughs> Child. You gave me a ring, father, with a seal of our family. I still wear it. It's enough to break a pane of glass. Goodbye. Harry? He's too far away to hear it. He will hear this. A uh, sampan picked me up, but I almost drowned myself first, thinking about all that gold. Half a million dollars worth of it going down to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Have another gin sling? Thanks again, Mr. Lyme. Well, that's the story. Here's why I told it to you. I know the spot where this happened. I've got it marked exactly on the map. Cost about 20,000 pounds to do the salvage, but that still leaves a pretty big margin of profit. And I just wondered if you'd be interested, sir, in, in investing. Mr. Lyme, I wonder if you know who I am. Well, no, no, not, not exactly. I... I'm the Lord Constable and Chief of Police in this colony. We have a full dossier on your activities as a confidence man, and I thought I'd let you tell your tale because I wanted to know how you work. Lyme, that salvage rack, it's the oldest of all the old skin games. I'm surprised that you're trying it on anybody, least of all a policeman. Good night now. And by the way, we'd be much happier here if you'd leave town. Within the next 24 hours, that is. Well, um, pip pip. Uh, pip pip. Another gin sling, sir? Uh, no. Oh. Just give me the check. <laughs> Harry Lyon returns in just a moment. And now, Harry Lyon. <laughs> well, friends... I think you understand why I don't like telling that story. Whoever I tell it to usually turns out to be a cop. That isn't the worst of it. The worst of it is that it's true. Well, pip pip.
The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Get out of the basement, I suppose. Not the safest place in the building, is it? Some of those walls are pretty thick down there, Mr. Hughes. Yeah, a lot of good that'd do if the whole bloody building collapsed on top of us, I must say. Do you think the bombing will get worse, Mr. Hughes? Oh, I think a lot of things will get worse before they get better, son. Come along, down we go. <sighs> Namely, being cooped up for eight hours with Messrs. Smithers, Jackson and Conway. <laughs> what a motley crew we are, eh? Clambering about in dungarees and tin hats hoping to stop the second fire of London with a bucket of sand and a stirrup pump that wouldn't give you a decent wash. It's better than nothing, I suppose. <sighs> well, what do you bet, Raymond, that Smithers says as I open the door? Well, Hughes, certain the building's empty. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hughes, certain the building's empty. Uh, yes. No one here but ourselves, eh, Raymond? Yes, Mr Smithers, the building is empty. Stirrup pumps are in position, sand buckets filled, and we're all fed, watered, and fully clad and in our right minds. At least I am. For God's sake, don't be an old woman. It is my job to make sure everything is as it should be. Now, Mr. Drayton, you signed the duty book. What? If you would be so kind as to tear yourself away from that novel you're reading, I asked if you'd signed the duty book. Yes. Oh, no, I haven't. No. Uh, anyone got a pen? You should have brought a fountain pen with you, together with a notebook. You can get a nice thick one from Woolworths for a penny. Oh, for God's sake, must we go through this palaver every night? Damn it, there are only six of us. We all know we're here. Question is, are we all there? Prancing around in tin hats, playing with stirrup pumps. May I remind you, Jackson, that it is 1940 and there's a war on? Well, I'll tell you something. If nothing happens by two o'clock, I'm going home. What? It is our duty night, Jackson, and here we all stay until daybreak. There's a full moon tonight, and that could well mean an air raid, a heavy one. If this place goes up in flames, it'll be our responsibility. Rubbish! If incendiaries fall on the roof, they'll most likely burn themselves out. There's nothing we can do apart from sit here and wait for someone to dig us out. Always supposing we aren't flattened. Mm. You forget that there's one who watches over us. So long as we put our trust in him, all will be well. <laughs> Perpetual optimist. Here's your intelligence, man. At this moment, people are dying violently all over the world, and he isn't doing a bloody thing about it. And we're flirting with death every time we go up on the roof during an air raid. Now look here, you I stupid. have formed a philosophy that I would advise you to follow. Oh, my mm. God. So long as the war continues, look upon yourselves as already dead. What? Well, then, every day that finds you still breathing 
is an unmerited bonus. I think that's an unduly pessimistic viewpoint. Oh, God, do you have to start, Conway? Why don't you keep quiet and let them get on with it, like me? I hope I'm entitled to express my views as well as anyone here. Democracy is what this war's about. Mm. As I was saying, I think what Mr Drayton says is unduly pessimistic. A Christian has no fear of death... As he knows it's only a doorway to paradise, a place of eternal bliss. Just a moment. If this place is so good, what are you hanging round for? Are we to understand you're looking forward to dying? That is a stupid question. Of course I want to live as long as possible. It would be a mortal sin to wish otherwise. What I intended to imply was simply that under the circumstances... Here they come. You won't be going home tonight, Jackson. No. All right, lads, you know what to do. Grab your gas masks and put your helmets on and enter your post. Young Raymond, you will man the telephone. Come on now, best foot forward up on the roof. Oh, don't panic. There could be anything up to ten minutes between the siren sounding and the arrival of the first planes. Then the damn things have got to find us, which in all probability they never will. So calm down and stop prancing around like a fussy old hen. Now, look here, Jackson. I've had just about enough of you. You're a damn oh, no, stupid no, little... What would the God Box meeting say? You know, I wonder why you take the trouble to come here if this is the only attitude you can take. That's a question I often ask myself. Probably because watching you getting hot and bothered is better than a tonic. Breaks the bloody monotony. I do not get hot and bothered! Oh, please, gentlemen. This continuous bickering is not conducive to peace of mind, which all of us badly need in these trying times. Now, might I suggest that if you can't address one another in a, in a civilised manner... You declare a non-speaking truce. But he started it. He always does. Everyone knows that. Shall we get ready and take up our positions? Unless I am mistaken. Enemy planes are already overhead. Yes, you're right. Right, come on up the stairs, everyone. Go oh, down. I've left my gloves behind. Hold on a moment. Oh, no, you don't, Jackson. We haven't time to waste. Raymond? Yeah, OK, I'll get them. Where are they? On the shelf by my bunk. Well, hurry up, Raymond. We haven't got all night. I can't see them. That was close. They're getting nearer. Well, we all made it then. Christ, I thought my time had come. God saved us. I said a prayer when I heard that one coming. And he must have heard me. The pity he didn't turn the bloody thing round and send it back where it came from. Which it is. Where do we go from here? You notice something? What? The light's still on. Only just... Yeah, but it is still on. The bomb must have glanced off the outer wall. The hole is blocked by a fall from higher up. Sooner or later, the ARP boys will take us out. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I think we must face facts. The raid is still going on. I think it must be an extremely heavy one. Now, it's quite possible that no rescue bib will be made until after daybreak. If not, later. Now, in the meantime, it may have escaped your notice that the ventilation system is no longer working. They are maybe coming down to us through the ruins, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, lad. We'll manage somehow. <laughs> Having been spared from the blast, it's inconceivable that we should suffocate. Uh, it might be inconceivable, but it's quite possible. Oh, oh, can't you stop that boy oh, snivelling? Come on. Things are no worse for him than for the rest of us. Oh, I can't agree with that. The situation is far worse for him. Most of us have gone, what, ten years left? The very best. He might be gone for another 60. Wow. He has every right to mourn. Oh, damn that for a tale. I intend to hang on to whatever time's left to me. 
I propose we start shifting some of that rubble outside and try to get through the side wall. My very thought. And if we get properly organised, it might be possible to break through in time. What do you say, Mr. Drayton? Well, certainly keep us occupied and he may be successful, but <coughs> we'll, we'll have to move with extreme care or the whole lot will be down on top of us. Right, now let's get cracking. Come on, Raymond, stir yourself, lad. <coughs> Now you take my box of matches and light all the hurricane lamps. We'll need them when we tunnel through all that rubble. Uh, uh, yes, 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 Mr. Right. Smith. Now, Jackson, you have a shot at trying to raise someone on the telephone. Oh. You've got some bloody well, you never know. Oh. Electricity's still coming through, so the phone could still be working. <laughs> oh! What the hell are you doing, boy? Can't you get those hurricane lamps lit? No, I can't help it, Mr. Hughes. I'm, 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 sh I'm shaking all over. God help England if they ever get you in the army. You'd be Hitler's secret weapon. Oh, uh, come on, Raymond. Come on, come on. Lay down over here, lad. Come on. Now you're suffering for shock. Now just wrap yourself up in these blankets and keep warm. There's, there's enough of us here to do what can be done without your help. Oh, hello. Hello. This is the fire watching post at Mansfield and Hedges. Listen, will you? We are trapped in the basement. Oh, for God's sake, let me get a word in. Hello? Hello? Oh, what's the trouble? Have you got someone? Well, I'm not talking to myself, am I? Some girl or other who keeps on asking if there's anyone there. Seems I can hear her, but she can't hear me. Yeah, give it to me. Oh. Hello? Hello, this is the firefighting post. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can... What's happened? Oh, I'm telling you, she can't hear us, but we can hear her. Uh, the line went dead. Never mind, we'll try again later. Come on, let's get to work. There's not a hope of getting through this lot. Uh, the slightest movement will bring the ceiling and whatever's above uh, it down on us. Yeah, but we must try. We can't give up now. Oh, please yourself. Don't say I haven't warned you. We're not doing too badly. Six steps are clear. There's a small cavity here in the left wall. Oh, hold the lamp steady, for God's sake. Drayton. Drayton, what are you doing? What's the matter? There's a body here. Body? Are you sure? Well, I mean, how could that be? Well, look. See for yourself. But who the hell is it? Yeah, exactly. Someone standing by the wall outside when the bomb fell? No, that's not possible. No, they would have been blown to bits. Got the full blast. No, he must have been on the inside. On the stairs at the time. What the hell are you talking about, man? There was only us on the stairs. There couldn't have been anyone else. Well, the, the body's still warm. Can't have been dead for more than an hour. Maybe he fell fr from above. Well, the ceiling's still intact, so he can't have come from that direction. Look, I, I don't think there's much point in going on with this fruitless task. I... I suggest we leave off for a while and give the matter our full consideration. Raymond's asleep. Mm. Lucky sod. I'm going to try the phone again. Maybe whatever was wrong with it has been put right. Hello? Hello? Not a dicky bird. Guess the exchange has been hit. My God, they're going hammer and tongs out there tonight. Perhaps we're in the best place after all. The air doesn't seem to have got any worse. The light has. Doesn't seem as bright as it was, or am I imagining it? Uh, there's one point I'd like to clear up. Smithers, yeah. were you at the top of the stairs? Did you have the door open? No, I, I heard my hand on the handle, but the moment I heard the bomb, I let go and tumbled down the stairs with the rest of you. Yes, that's what I thought. I suppose there's, there's no way the door could have been blown open and then closed again before the wall collapsed. Huh? I don't know. 
And I, I, I was thinking that if someone had been sheltering in the upper passage, they might have been, uh, what, blown in? Well, it's most improbable. I mean, if the door was opened by the blast, debris would have kept it open. I mean, mm. what are you getting at, Drayton? I have arrived at the stage where the possible must be discarded and the improbable considered. Now, having confirmed that the door could not have been opened and that there was no one on the stairs except ourselves, I am reluctantly, very reluctantly, drawn to only one conclusion. And what's that? Gentlemen, I am going to ask you to consider the possibility that one of us is dead. I always thought you were potty, Drayton. A bloody crank. Out of touch with reality. Oh, by God, you've gone too far this time. All right, then offer me another more sane explanation. You can't, eh? No, no, none of you can. Now, believe me, I would have kept this uh, diagnosis to myself, but whoever it is that has left his earthly body back there on the stairs must be made to realise his position. Oh, no, then consider the possible fact that it is you lying out there. That's the horrible part of the entire business. Whoever it is doesn't know... He's dead. Look, just suppose you're right. Yeah. How can you explain why a dead man should walk around with a normal body when the one he's been born with is lying under several tons of bricks? Oh, all right, all right. I, I, I will try to answer that as best I can. Now, it is quite possible that we all have two bodies. Oh. One of dense material that we use in this life and the other that, uh, for want of a better description, is comprised of higher vibrating atoms. When there is a violent death, Shock can result in an unnatural phenomenon. The vibrations can be slowed down and, in rare cases, exactly match those of the defunct body. Look, hold on a moment. Look, I can quite well see if that is the case, the poor bleeder doesn't know he's yeah, dead, right. but how long does he carry on like this? I'd say, if we can't settle this problem beforehand, devibrating won't start until someone from the outside enters this room. What happens then? The secondary body will become invisible, but will still be here. Become what is commonly called a ghost, that can be seen by certain people when the conditions are favourable. Rubbish! Exactly. All of you must be mad just to listen to him. When you're dead, you're dead. Finished. Do you fully understand what he's saying? One of us is a bloody ghost? I mean, honestly, think about it. <laughs> Conway, yeah. all 16 stone of you. According to Mr Drayton, you could be a spook. Or you, Smithers. Yeah. Far cry from your nightgown heart playing angel wing paradise. Huh? Oh, what about young Raymond over here? He's snoring like a pig, but I suppose you haven't ruled him out. As a matter of fact, at the moment, you are my number one suspect. What? That might be why you could hear the girl on the telephone, but she couldn't hear you. This is a local affair. Figuratively speaking, you wouldn't exist outside this shelter. My pulse is beating 13 to the dozen. I'm solid, warm, with blood streaming through my veins. If I was to hit you, you'd feel my fist. How the hell can I be dead? I have just explained that. I'm not dead. I'm not! If there's any truth in all this, it must be one of you. Smithers, you are higher up the stairs than the rest of us. I bet it's you. Come to think of it, you've been acting strangely since we came back down here. Admit it, man. You must know. No. No, it can't be me. I mean, I didn't lose consciousness for a single second. And, and I'm bruised all over. Wait a minute. Conway, you were up first, full of energy, and so far as I can see, not a scratch on you. It must be you. No. If that's my body out there, then my legs must have shrunk. Mine are like tree trunks. Right, Mr Drayton? Gentlemen, this is getting us nowhere. Earlier, I advised you to regard yourselves as already dead. Now I am suggesting you do just that, literally. Let us all say, I am the one. Accept that you are a dead man still functioning among five live ones, then whoever it is 
will be free. Free to do what? Free to leave this place. Oh. Raymond's awake, I see. Well, now, how do you feel, lad? Oh, I feel... I feel funny. All woozy. Is there any chance of a cup of tea? <laughs> You've got some hope. Can't think why you should feel funny. You've been sleeping your head off while the rest of us have been sweating blood. I had a strange dream. Somehow I got out of here and was walking down Canberra Street. Bombs were falling everywhere, but they didn't seem to bother me. It was as though I knew that they couldn't hurt me. Then I came to the ARP post and went down the steps into the basement. There were several men seated round a table, including Mr Sinclair, who's in charge of our office. But when I tried to explain what had happened here, he ignored me. Do you remember leaving the ARP post? No. No, I suddenly wanted to be back here with all of you. Then I was just outside, looking at a great pile of rubble that completely hid the entrance. There was a man waiting. Can... Can you describe this man? I think so. Although he wasn't like anyone I'd ever seen before. I had the impression he was dressed in black. A kind of long robe. But it was his face that demanded my full attention. So white. It almost shone. And the eyes were very large. Very dark and bright with... Well... Pity. Intelligence, knowledge, I don't know, perhaps all three. Then he said... Only I don't think he said anything. I, I just heard the words in my head. Don't go back in there. You belong in another place. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Doubtless you have no reason to believe that the experience is anything more than a particularly vivid dream. Oh, no, of course not. No. What else could it be? Oh, what indeed. I must tell you that there is a body half buried under the ruins of the outer wall and there is no way its presence can be explained unless it is one of us. Is this some kind of joke? Not of our making, lad. This... Damn business is getting madder by the second. We'll settle this matter once and for all. Do what should have been done in the first place. Dig the damn body out and try to find out who it belongs to. Very well. We'll do what must be done. But every one of you must be prepared. Accept my word that the man I will name is the one. Know for an indisputable fact that you are dead and have no right to be in this place. Oh, should the body be mine... I will not linger. That much I can promise. Well, Mr Drayton, what did you find out? Whose body lies in there? Under it, I found this. It is a pocket edition of Pilgrim's Progress. On the inside of the front cover is inscribed to Harold Smithers from his good friend Arthur Brown. It's you, Smithers. You're dead, man. Dead. And oh, most merciful God, I'm alive. May I be forgiven. I didn't... did not believe. Gone. He's not here. Well, that was to be expected. He knew at last and accepted. There was no way he could remain after that. He's free. Maybe as time passes, we'll try to believe that none of this happened. Pretend we were all suffering from shock, illusions. And perhaps that'll be for the best. Raymond, it's all over. Sounds as if they're digging away up there. That means you'll soon be home. Getting yourself wrapped round powdered egg and tin bacon, eh? How do you feel about that? <sighs> Fine, I think. But are you sure it's all over? I, I, I still feel funny. Bound to. 
We all feel funny. Why do we not all crawling on all fours? You must forget all about this. Take Mr. Hughes' advice. Pretend none of it happened. Ten minutes or less, you'd find them down here. I bet they'll be surprised to find any of us alive. I suppose there's no point in us giving him a hand. What's the matter, Drayton? What are you looking so miserable about? Well, I fear I have to tell you. Well, what's the matter, man? When I was in the hole, you may remember there was a fall of rubble. It was soon after you left and I continued on my own. Well, that fall uncovered another section of the wall. It also revealed four more bodies. So, there are four more bodies. There's been a damn great air raid and there must be quite a few bodies lying around. Please, don't make me spill it out. You'll know. I'm not going to listen. You're stark raving mad. We've humoured you over Smithers, but this is too much. I, I don't understand. What in God's name are you talking about? He... He's suggesting that we've been playing the wrong game. Not who's the ghost, but who's the live one. And the answer is himself, right, Drayton? Never mind me, just believe. Accept your condition and go. Go. Go before they break through. Don't get trapped down here, be forced to haunt this place forever. Okay, I was through. saved by a fluke. Through, you all fell on top of me and then, then the blast lifted you off again. That man, the one in my dream, he's out there beckoning. Please don't let me go. Please. The light's going out. Hey, Harry, get some light over here. I think there's someone alive. I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm alive. It's no good, Raymond. Life's gone. It's pitch black. You got them lights, Harry? Yeah, aye, that's it. Yes, I'm right. There is someone. Here, mate. Give me your hand. That's it. You're the only one left. I... I think so. Merciful God. I think so. October is birthday month for Weird Darkness, but while it's our birthday, we want the gifts to go to those who help people who suffer from depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That's what our annual Overcoming the Darkness campaign is all about. It's the only fundraiser I have all year long, all October long. You can bring hope to those who are lost in the darkness. You can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. This year, the total raised will be divided equally between four different organizations that help people who struggle with depression. I'll close out the fundraiser at the end of October and announce how much we raised. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month, and you can help us get there. To donate or to get more information about the fundraiser and the four organizations we're supporting, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Again, I'm only conducting this fundraiser during the month of October, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. 
WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Do not break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Devil's Deep. At the foot of a great cliff, a police launch is being slowly pushed by the ocean currents toward jagged rocks where the water boils and swirls as in a giant cauldron. Searchlights stab the darkness to reveal grappling irons, probing the inky waters of the Devil's Deep. Hey, Inspector Bowman! Captain wants to know if he can turn a launch around now. He says Devil's Deep is no place to be caught when the tide turns. Tell him to hold it a minute, Sergeant. I think we got our corpse. Uh, give me a hand pulling that rope. Uh, okay. Uh, why is it they always seem heavier when they're dead? Never mind the questions. Just get them over the side. Uh, right. Uh, okay? Yeah. Take her out, Cap. Yeah, we'll stretch him out on deck for you, Inspector Bowman. Drowned, eh? Maybe. Fell off the cliff up there. To swing that searchlight down here. Yeah, he's the one I want, all right. Good gravy. There was another one? Yeah, two of them. Uh, help me unbutton his coat. Well, in that case, you're lucky to have dragged up the one you wanted. You're telling me? I have two suspects back at headquarters. One of them is lying about how this guy was killed. Well, uh, which was it? The fall from the cliff or a drowning? Neither, Sergeant. Take a look at this bullet hole. <laughs> I sent for you, Miss Scott, and you, Mr. Malone, because I have some new evidence. I want the whole story, everything. But, Inspector Bowman, I I've told you how it happened. From the beginning this time, Miss Scott, and with no hints from you, Mr. Malone. Well, I'm sorry, Inspector, but this seems unfair. You've got absolutely nothing on either Miss Scott or myself. I'll decide that, Mr. Malone. If you please, Miss Scott. Well... I came here to the island because of my stepbrother. You see, Duncan and I were closer than many real brothers and sisters. I'd taken care of him ever since our folks died. I guess I decided to come that day in the doctor's office when he said... Ever since I've known you, Peggy Scott, you've been saddled with that young brother of yours. Well, I've almost made up my mind to buy a cottage on the island, Dr. Ramsey. Uh -huh. Oh, it's a lovely cottage. Set back from a high cliff. It's straight out of a storybook. Good. It might get him away from his imagination. He's got too much, Peggy. It's bad. I know. But I understand him, Doctor. And I can give him understanding and kindness. Well, it sounds like the very thing, Peggy. 
But take my advice and go down by boat. As long as you avoid people, you and Duncan are avoiding trouble. It was early in the season, and there weren't many passengers on the steamer that crawled along the coast. But even so, there was one too many. For fate sent Mr. Sherman across our path. Events were already closing in on me the first morning when I was trying to make Duncan comfortable in his deck chair. I wish you wouldn't treat me like a baby. I want to go to my stateroom and read. Oh, you promise not to open that trunk full of books until we reach the island, Duncan. Now, here. Let me fix that blanket. Let me alone, will you, Peggy? That old fool is looking at us again. I'd like to wring his neck. That's no way to talk about Mr. Sherman. He was very sweet to us. Helping us with our bags was just an excuse. He's been following us ever since we got on board. Haven't you noticed the way he's looking at you? Keep him away from his Peggy or say, help me out. You what, Duncan? Nothing, Pedge. Maybe I'm just imagining things at that. Oh, I do wish you'd try to get over it, Duncan. Why, Peggy? Imagination's a handy thing, you know. Lots of times it helps you to look into the future. The future fast became the present. And on a ship, there's very little chance to escape it. Certainly, I never expected the train of events that harmless little Mr. Sherman's attention was to bring. I can still remember how apologetic he looked the next day when he finally found me alone. Well, it's a, it's a lovely day, Miss Scott, isn't it? You mind if I sit down? Oh, I know, Mr. Sherman. Of course not. Well, I confess I'm relieved your brother isn't on deck today, Miss Scott. I do believe he dislikes me. Oh, Duncan takes a bit of understanding, Mr. Sherman. He's he's not well. Uh, that hardly explains it, but... Well, I'll make friends with a boy yet. You'll see. I hear you've bought the place at Devil's Deep. A rather lonely place for just the two of you. You sound as though you've been on the island before, Mr. Sherman. Oh, come up every summer. Miss Scott, do uh, you know that chap over there? The one in the trench coat and the battered brown hat? Yes. This is the second time in the last hour I've caught him staring at me. Well, maybe he thinks he knows you. Well, we'll ignore him. No doubt you'll attract enough handsome young men without adding me to the competition. I must get around that brother of yours, though. Now, I'll drop down to his stateroom and have a chat with him. Oh, no, no. Uh, hmm? That is, I'd wait until he's feeling better. He, he might not be very friendly and... No? Well, now, don't you worry about that, young lady. I'll... I'll turn on the famous Sherman charm. That'll do the trick. My friends tell me it's fatal. Absolutely fatal. My stateroom was directly across from Duncan's in one of those passageways that leads onto the deck. When I retired that night, I left my door ajar in case he should call. I don't know how late it was when I awakened, but it was the sound of his door that brought me to with a start. Then after a moment... I heard something heavy being moved on deck. I got to the window in time to see Duncan pushing something through the lifeboats. Without stopping to think, I grabbed my robe and rushed out. I saw him leaning against a lifeboat, looking down into the water. Duncan! Duncan! Duncan, are you all right? Well, hello, Pegs. Of course I'm all right. What are you doing out here? Well, I heard you, Duncan. You were moving something. Yeah. My trunk. Your trunk? With your books in it? That's right. I pushed it overboard. Oh, Duncan. Didn't you notice that man in the trench coat there beyond the lifeboat? Come on, let's go back. He's coming over here. Let him come. It's none of his business. Come along, Duncan. I'm not going to stand here and be made a fool of. Let's walk back to the room. All right, all right. Watch your step, Peggy. I had to lift the trunk over that threshold thing. That's it. Well, good night. Not so fast, young man. You haven't even started for bed. I'm coming in No, and... Peggy, leave me alone, will you? I don't want you in my cabin. Nevertheless, I'm coming in. Now, where's the light switch? Oh. Now, Duncan, I'm not going to move until I see you take your jacket off and start... Duncan! Your books are piled up against the wall. They weren't in the... Duncan. What was in that trunk? <laughs> Mr. Sherman had disappeared. When we docked next morning, I looked for him. He didn't get off the boat. The purser hadn't seen him. I was frantic. I couldn't believe Duncan had... had... 
Anyway, I decided to go to the cottage first and then come back and phone Dr. Ramsey. As you know, there's no road to Devil's Deep. My stepbrother and I walked along the path through the woods. It was almost noon when we reached the house. Well, sis, this place isn't bad at all. Sort of wild and woolly. Hear that surf beating on the rocks down below? Leave the bags out here and go on inside, Duncan. Yeah, all right, sure. Say, this is all right, Peggy. Nice and cozy. Fireplace and everything. Oh, Duncan, if only... Duncan, sit down, dear. I've got to talk with you. Peggy, what's the use of questions? You know how I get mixed up sometimes? I forget things I've done. So I simply forgot I'd taken the books out of my trunk, that's all. You don't know how I want to believe you, dear, but I... Why don't you forget all about it, huh? I have. I feel better already. You ought to be glad that I've gotten out of the dumps. Oh, I am, Duncan. But after last night, I... What's that you've got there? A note. It was lying on the table. The cleaning woman must have left it. Here, let me see it. It's addressed to me, Peggy. I don't recognize the handwriting, do you? To you? That's strange. Who, who could have gotten here before us? It's easy enough to find out. But we don't know anybody here. I couldn't... Duncan, what's the matter? What does it say? It says... People hang for murder. Oh, please, dear, don't look like that. Here, let me have it. If silence is worth $10,000, I'll forget about that trunk. Blackmail? But who? Suddenly I realized. The young man in the trench coat. Then almost as an afterthought, it came over me. Duncan had really killed Mr. Sherman. It was in the open now. It had to be faced. What are we going to do, Peggy? They'll hang me. You know they will. Please, please, Duncan. I've got to think. I couldn't help it, Peggy. I, I didn't know what I was doing. That old fool's Germany came to see me. He drove me to it. Oh, I suppose I knew what had happened all the time. But I didn't want to believe it. We'll have to go to the police, Duncan. No. I'll kill myself first. I won't do it. you got to help me, Peggy. You're the only one who can. Oh, I've tried, dear. And maybe I've only hurt you. Don't you see that somebody else knows now, even though the note isn't signed? The guy in the trench coat says we can pay him off. Dad left you plenty. You can get the money. It wouldn't work, Duncan, even if it were right. Blackmail doesn't end anything. But it's my only chance, Pegs. I'll kill myself if you don't. You know what Dad said when he died? you got to take care of me. You'll get the money, won't you? Please, Peggy. All right, dear. I'll get the money. The Devil's Deep. A police launch has dragged the turbulent waters of the Devil's Deep and found the body of a man. So far, Inspector Bowman has neglected to mention that fact to the two young people who sit beneath the glaring light in his office. The eyes of the young man in the trench coat have never left Peggy Scott as she goes back over her story. So, Miss Scott, this brother of yours, Duncan, takes one of his crazy dislikes to this Sherman guy on the boat, and that night he shoves a trunk overboard. You were the one watching this, Malone? Naturally, Inspector. So when you found that blackmail note waiting for you in your cottage, Miss Scott, you knew right away it was Malone who was on to the murder. Yes, and I was sure of it after I'd gone to the bank that afternoon and arranged for a transfer of my funds. Hey, lady, wait a minute. Mind if I walk you back to Devil's Deep, Miss Scott? What? How did you know my name? What do you want? Oh, just a couple of questions, Miss Scott. Like, uh, are you in the habit of calling on bank presidents the minute you get in town? That is none of your business. I'm afraid it is. Very much my business. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten your note. I suppose that's true. Now, please, if you'll let me by. Not so fast, please. I've got to talk with you and your brother. Mr. Malone, if you're wise, you'll keep very much away from my stepbrother. That's a warning. We'll be ready for the next note when you send it. 
Goodbye. Suddenly, I knew that Duncan and this Mr. Malone must not meet. Above all else, I had to get my brother back to Dr. Ramsey before there was another tragedy. But next morning, when I returned from the bank where I had gone to sign the necessary papers... I'm back, Duncan. Want to help me? Duncan, what are you doing with that poker? We've got company, Peggy. Your stepbrother is a very excitable young man, Miss Scott. I was watching when he came sneaking in here. I warned you, Mr. Malone. But I suppose one in your profession doesn't mind a few risks. Tell me, did you know the man you were talking to on shipboard a few days ago? Now listen to me, you better Duncan, keep... what did Sherman say to your sister that caused you to get so excited? Get out. Get out, I tell you. Okay, okay, I'm going. Just let me warn you that you're playing with dynamite, Miss Scott. I'll be seeing you. I don't understand, Duncan. Why did he come here? On the table there. The blackmail note, Peggy. The second one. Like Mr. Malone, the note was confident and explicit, even to the denominations of the money to be tied into a package and brought to the cliff that night. Except for the second trip to the bank... Neither Duncan nor I left the cottage all day. Somehow we both had the feeling of being watched, and it grew stronger as evening approached. Finally, it was dark. Peggy, yes. go over here to the window. I saw a light moving down there along the shore. I, I guess the time has come, Duncan. Yeah. There it is again, Peggs. Mm-hmm. See, he's got a flashlight way down at the foot of the path. That means that he'll have to come through the woods to get out onto the cliff above Devil's Deep. He picked that spot because it's open ground. He can be sure there's nobody out there except me. Oh, I wish you didn't have to go. We could leave the money there. How could we? The note said me alone with the money. I'd better get out there before he does. Where's that package that the money up in? Here it is. I wondered if you were going to forget it. Forget it? Are you kidding, Peggy? You've got to be honest with me, Duncan. You weren't thinking of doing anything. Anything we'd both be sorry for? What do you mean? I... Like Sherman? Yes. Peggy, I tell you, I was crazy that night. All I want to do is get this over with. You'll see. I'll pay him off and I'll get right back here. All right, dear. Go quickly now. I'll be waiting for you. But I knew I wouldn't be, for I never intended to let Duncan meet Bob Malone. The package I'd given him contained torn strips of paper. It would never be opened because I was going to meet the blackmailer before he reached the cliff. Quickly, I got the money and slipped out the back way. There wasn't a sound except for the roar of the surf in the distance. The woods made the night even blacker. When I reached the path, there was no sign of the flashlight. But pretty soon, I thought I heard footsteps coming up. Suddenly, I heard a sound close behind me. As I turned, the earth opened up with a blinding flash and everything went black. Slowly, slowly I began to whirl back into the light. I I opened my eyes and saw I was back in the cottage, lying on the couch in the living room. After a moment, the ceiling tilted back into place, and I turned my head and tried to focus on the man sitting beside me. It's Bob Malone, Miss Scott. Don't be frightened. You got quite a sock on the head, but you're all right now. Why did you hit me? Don't try to talk. Just lie back and be quiet. Oh, but... but the money... It's in my pocket. Don't try to sit up. Take it and go. Go before... Before Duncan comes back. Your brother doesn't even know what's happened yet. He's still waiting out on the cliff. Hmm. Now, just forget him for a minute, Peggy, because I've got something more important for you right now. Sherman, come around the couch where Miss Scott can see you. Sherman? Mr. Sherman, but he... he he's dead. Oh, not at all, Miss Scott. Your friend Malone brought me back from a watery grave. Very inconsiderate, don't you think? Cut the crack, Sherman. Look, Peggy, if you'd given me half a break, I'd have told you I was a private detective. Sherman's a well-known blackmailer. When I spotted him talking to you on the boat, I figured it was worth looking into. But, Mr. Malone, then there never was any reason for Duncan to be blackmailed. Mr. Sherman tricked him. He, well, he somehow made Duncan think he'd killed him. I think your brother needs a psychiatrist, badly. That's not important now. The important thing is that Duncan's not a murderer. Oh, don't you understand? It was his imagination. Sometimes the things in his mind seem real to him. He hated Mr. Sherman enough to... Yes, that's it. Sherman worked on this quirk of his, got Duncan excited, faked a death scene... Now, look here, Malone. I told you before... all the time I was frightened to death of you, Mr. Malone. That's my fault. When I saw your brother push that trunk overboard, I got kind of worried. 
I checked the passenger list and then everyone who got off the boat. So did I. And Mr. Sherman didn't get off. Oh, yes, he did. After you were nowhere around. You were a little too anxious to believe the worst of your brother, if I may say so, Miss Scott. I told you to keep out of this, Sherman. You see, Peggy, when I saw our blackmailing friend and knew there wasn't anybody in that trunk, I stopped worrying. Like fun you did, old boy. You've been tailing me ever since you saw me talking to the young lady that morning. But I never figured it was more than your usual blackmail routine till I saw how scared Miss Scott was. Yes, but don't you see? Duncan and I thought he was dead. Yes, I see that now. Lucky I followed him out here tonight. I was right behind him when he came up the path with the flashlight. It's too bad you couldn't have stopped him from hitting me. But Shut he... up, Sherman. Suppose you and I stroll down to the kid brother and tell him he can relax. Oh, but, but Duncan thinks he's dead. Don't you see the kind of a shock it'll be when he sees him? I can't leave Sherman here. Just you leave this to me. I don't think you should try to get up yet. Oh, but you don't understand. Duncan flies off the handle so easily. I know that only too well. Come along, Sherman. I think Miss Scott's stepbrother will be delighted to find you returned from the dead. Thank you, Miss Scott. I'll admit that up to this point, your story checks in every detail. But what actually happened afterwards out on that cliff? I don't really know, Inspector Bowman. I never saw Duncan or, or Mr. Sherman again. Mr. Malone was the only one to come back alive. I have told you what happened out there, Inspector, just as I told Miss Scott. Mr. Malone, you've told me that when Duncan saw Sherman, the man he thought he'd killed, he flew into a rage and attacked him. That Sherman had a revolver, and during the struggle, he shot Duncan, and they both went over the cliff. I'm sure that's what happened, Inspector. I should have known that... That's exactly what Duncan would do. I happen to know Sherman's record, Miss Scott. Blackmailer, yes, but he never carried a gun. That's what I thought. Why I didn't bother to search him. I'm afraid I can't believe him alone. We dragged the devil's deep an hour ago. We recovered Sherman's body. He was the one killed by the bullet. And you think maybe I took things into my own hands? If you didn't, I'm suggesting you tell us differently. Well, you forced me into a corner, Inspector. You asked for it, don't forget. Let's go back to the moment Sherman and I left Miss Scott in the cottage near the cliff. There was a bright moon as the blackmailer and I headed toward the spot where young Duncan sat on a rock, staring down into Devil's Deep. I wonder what Duncan's going to say when he sees me, Malone. I do make a rather healthy corpse, don't you think? That's your worry, Sherman. But I wouldn't like to be in your shoes. You don't go for that poor sick boy line with this kid, do you? I do, Sherman. He's studying to be a manic depressive. And he's on the way toward making the grade. Well, in that case, you're going to have a tough time proving anything against me, Malone. The blackmail notes in your handwriting are pretty good evidence, I'd say. Hold it now. The kid's seen us. Now, let me handle this. Everything under control, Duncan? Of course, Mr. Malone. I've been waiting for you. I saw you on the path a while ago. Good. Got anything to say to the ghost of Mr. Sherman? Plenty. Stupid bungling rat. I hope you give him the works. Now, look here, kid. I never did like this deal, but you made it seem harmless enough. Do you think it was harmless, Duncan, to hire Sherman to make like a corpse so you could blackmail yourself and scare your sister into paying off? I should really have killed him. All he had to do was stay out of your way. All this might have been more harmless, Duncan, if you hadn't sneaked back and slugged your sister just before we came up the path. Was that necessary? I was pretty mad when I opened that package and found the paper she'd given me. I had to get my money without letting her know it was me. You know, I could have worked this blackmail stunt again sometime. Yeah, I suppose you could. Too bad I came along just then and drove you off. You'll never get the money now. I'll get it, don't worry. And all the rest of it, too, it belongs to me. My father should never have left it to her. I'm afraid, Duncan, that sooner or later you might kill Peggy. Well, maybe I will if she gets wives to me. Now look, Malone, I'd never have got mixed up with a kid if I'd known this. Not very pretty, is it? Don't forget that if anything happened to his sister, he had threatening letters in your handwriting. Where do you think that would have put you? He was going to give them back when he paid me my grand here on the cliff tonight. Ah, you're a fool, Sherman. Why do you think I told you to pick Devil's Deep for a meeting place? And those notes I delivered by myself. Get it, Sherman? Noble brother meets nasty blackmailer, shoves him off cliff in self-defense. Neat, huh? I wasn't acting when I said I hated you, Sherman. I never could stand the way you looked at Peggy. Why, you little rat, that's fine coming from you. I ought to... Look out, he may have a gun. Of course I have. Why do you think I let the two of you come out here after me? After I get rid of you, I'm still going to get that money. Listen, kid. I'm going to take that gun away from you and give you the spanking of your life. Keep away from the edge, Sherman. He'll plug you as short as... He hasn't got what it takes. Just a loudmouth brat. 
Go on, you keep backing up toward the edge, sonny boy, and pretty soon... Take another step, Sherman, and I'll shoot. No, you won't, kid, because I'm going to... That's the story, Inspector. I didn't tell it because I... Well, I hope Miss Scott wouldn't have to know. Sorry it had to come out this way, Miss Scott. Oh, if only I could have helped him. You tried. But Duncan was really dangerous. Maybe it's just as well that fate stepped in and took a hand. As though some evil force had claimed him. Yeah. The devil's deep. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. Be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. Your Bigfoot Expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon, or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. You came to me with a torch and a gun. You call it righteousness. Call it by its right name, murder.
Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Come in. Oh, clean socks, Mr. Paladin. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clean socks for a trip, very important. Oh, yes, thank you. Hey, boy, just put them in the bag there. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 bottle of brandy in bag, too. It's for the trip, very important. Oh, oh, snake bite. (laughs) Correct. Oh, no snakes in Nevada territory this time of year. Why not? Too cold. Oh, maybe brandy for other purpose, like uh, drinking? (laughs) Maybe. Or maybe to give lady named Cleo to uh, make warm? The lady named Cleo has hired me to do a job, that's all. Oh, sure. She wants me to find her husband. Oh, sure. And she's paying me very well. Oh, sure. Hey, boy. You know what you are? No, what I are? Auf den Knödel. Auf den Knödel? Yes. Now, carry this down to the lobby for me. I'm ready to leave the comforts of the Carlton Hotel and head for the wilds of Nevada. Auf den Knödel. Do you see speed laws and other regulations as restrictive? Or do you look upon them as protective? When a police officer writes a summons for traffic violations, do you see him as an enemy or a friend? Your life may depend on your attitudes. Statistics clearly indicate that where laws are obeyed, deaths go down. It's no secret that emotional immaturity is the major factor in our accident rate. How else but childish can you describe the notion that breaking a traffic regulation is a way of getting away with something? What could be more infantile than believing one can prove his superiority by ignoring a stoplight? Unfortunately, too many drivers on the road subscribe to that kind of emotional outlook. The result is tragic. Almost 85% of all traffic accidents in America are caused by careless, childish driving. We hope you know our traffic laws and the people who enforce them are there to help save your life. A lady named Cleo, whom I had traveled over a thousand miles to help, turned out to be a fat shrew of 50, and her desperate need of me was to find a husband who had understandably tried to blot out his memory of her with drink. By the time I found him, he'd done pretty well. I figured they deserved each other, so I brought him back, memory and all. But I was left in the middle of the Nevada desert, miles from the railroad. I'd been riding for a full day when I heard a strange sound in the desert stillness. Or at least, a strange sound for that lonesome place. It was a baby's cry. And then I saw the wagon. It sat alone, without horses, forlorn in the sand. No sign of life, except the sound. I dismounted and walked toward the wagon. Get away from that wagon. Well, I thought it was deserted. Move away, mister, while you still can. Is this all right? Now get on your horse and ride on. Are you alone here? That don't matter. A woman can't last out here by herself. Where's your man? Clear out, mister. What's that you've been digging? It don't concern you. Is it a grave? Who's it for? The baby and me. Oh, look, I don't know what this is all about, but won't you let me help you? You can't help us none. I can try. You ain't a doctor, are you? No, I'm not. Move on, then. What's wrong with the baby? Typhoid. Typhoid fever. Well, maybe I oh. could have... Fast, mister. I'd just as soon shoot you dead as know you got a killing fever from us. But you just can't stay Please, out mister. here. The... I ain't got the strength to dig another grave. Has the doctor seen your baby? No. Well, then you can't be sure it's typhoid. Mr. Mulrooney knows. Who? Mulrooney, the wagon master. He knows the symptoms. 
And he just cut you loose? Left you out here to die? He said it was either the baby and me or the whole wagon train. Are they sending help? What can they do? Well, there's a settlement less than a day's ride from here. We'll hitch my horse to the wagon no. and head out. They won't let us in. The wagon train's there by now. They'll know about the typhoid. They'll never let us in, not now. Uh, look, there's fresh water and food in my saddlebag. Enough to hold you till I get back. Where are you going? To get help. Mister, you don't have to do this. Let's just say I want to. Pardon me, ma'am. Yes? They said at the store I'd find a doctor at this house. Yes, that's right. Well, my name is Paladin. I'd like to speak to the doctor, if I may. You are, Mr. Paladin. You're the doctor? Dr. Phyllis Thackeray. Oh, well, how do you do? Didn't they tell you down at the store? Well, there were some looks. I guess people out here haven't got used to the idea of a woman doctor. Most of them won't even believe I am a doctor. Are you? My diploma's inside, if you care to look. Oh, well, no, no, I'm not the patient. Who is, then? A woman and her baby. What's wrong with them? Uh, the baby might have typhoid fever. Might have? Well, I'm not sure. Where are they? They're lying in a wagon a day's ride from here. I see. It's a long ride. You'll find my horse in the stable. By the time you have him saddled, I'll be ready to go. <laughs> You're quite a woman. I'm a doctor, Mr. Paladin. Uh, wait a minute. Oh. Looks like a delegation, doesn't it? Yeah. Just a minute, you two. I got something to say. Yes, Mr. Davis? Mr. You didn't tell us those people had typhoid fever. No, I didn't. Who did? I did. My name's Jeremiah Mulrooney. Well, now, Mulrooney. You don't look like a murderer. Why? You sentenced that woman and her baby to die when you left them out in the desert. They're diseased. You've done nothing to help them? Uh, look, mister, typhoid's a terrible thing. It, it's nothing to fool around with. We don't want it here. He that touches pitch shall be defiled forthwith. You've consorted with the disease. The fever is upon you, too. So, uh, you'd better make tracks, mister. Wait. Mr. Davis, he's not even sure it is typhoid. I'm sure. I saw it. You're not qualified to say. And who says she is? Uh, are you going out there with this man, Miss Thackeray? Well, of course, Mr. Davis. I'm a doctor. All right, that's up to you. But once you mix with a fever, you're not welcome back here. And don't try bringing those fever patients back here, either. If we have to bring them back, we will. Look, we got folks to protect, children of our own. And we'll shoot you down if we have to, to keep them safe. They mean what they say, Mr. Paladin. So do I. You ready to go? I'm ready. Of all leading filters, cigarettes, Kent filters best, Kent filters best. It makes good sense when you smoke Kent, Kent. Filters best of all of the brands of cigarettes. Can't taste the best. Can't taste the best. A richer taste than all the rest. Can't filters best. I guess perhaps I wasn't used to the idea of a woman doctor myself, especially one as pretty as Phyllis Thackeray. She rode beside me through the desert, all night, without rest, without complaint. Now it was just after sunrise. 
Maybe I should have brought something for saddle swords. <laughs> you want to rest? I want to get to that baby. Yeah. Shouldn't be long now. Good. You know, you should be on a velvet settee, wearing a hoop skirt and fluttering your eyelash over a fan. I tried that. It was too easy. <laughs> Is that why you studied medicine? This was hard? Maybe. Something like that. Wasn't it tough enough practicing back east? I guess I'm as much missionary as physician. I was the second woman to graduate from my medical school. Others came after me. It was difficult for all of us, but gradually we're becoming accepted as something better than freaks. <laughs> You're not accepted yet. You just got run out of town. Well, maybe I'm not the missionary I think I am. Or the doctor. Well, we'll see. Here's the wagon up ahead. I don't see anybody. Uh, neither do I. Come on. They're in there, all right. Both sleeping. I hope that's what it is. Is there anything I can do? Just help me up there. Right. And cross your fingers. Doctor, coffee's ready. Mm, smells good. The food will be ready in a minute. Here. Well, thanks. How are they? Well, the mother's suffering from exhaustion, exposure, nerves, no sleep. The baby? Typhoid? Well, maybe. I don't know yet. Mulroney knows all the symptoms. So do I. High fever, red spots, delirium, then a coma that leads to the crisis. The baby has all of them. Still, it could be something else. But whatever it is, I can't do much for her in this wilderness. You want to take them back to town? Yes. You know what that means. Yes. It's necessary, medically? Yes. I'll hitch the horses to the wagon. Mr. Paladin. Hmm? You don't have to come with me. I wouldn't miss it. There's something about that Mulroney's face I didn't like. Stop that wagon right there. Don't come no bother. Whoa. They have guns, Mr. Paladin. I'm going to try to talk some sense into their heads. Here, hold the reins. Stand right there. No closer. Dr. Thackeray has examined the woman and child. The woman has no signs of typhoid. Her child is diseased. The doctor isn't sure the baby has typhoid. I'm sure. That baby needs treatment. Now, Mr. Davis, you're a sensible man. Are you going to let Mulrooney sentence a woman and child to death? We'll bring what you need out here. But you ain't bringing them into town. They'll be completely isolated in the doctor's office. Paladin, they're sick and we can't take the chance. We've got to protect us. They're not as sick as you people. Now, you may be able to keep them out of this settlement. But you'll carry your own sickness with you wherever you go. You'll die again every time you see a baby smile. We've got our own kids to think about. How do your children cry when they're sick? Any different from that baby? Suppose it was your child crying like that. Would you send it to the desert to die? Now listen to me, all of you. I'm driving that white into the doctor's office, and don't you try to stop me. If you need a doctor, you know where she'll be. We won't let you do it, Paladin. We won't let you bring disease and pestilence into our midst. I'm afraid they'll use those guns, Mr. Paladin. Get back there with Mrs. Benson. Both of you lie flat. You gonna try it? Go on, get back. Mr. Paladin, are you all right? Fine, fine, we're through. I'll have you in your office in another minute.
CBS Radio will score another goal on New Year's Day as most of these same stations bring you our play-by-play broadcasts of the two year-end football classics, the Orange Bowl and Cotton Bowl games. From the Orange Bowl, CBS News sports experts will call the thrills in the Oklahoma-Syracuse contest. Syracuse will be making its second appearance at the Orange Bowl this year with an 8-to-1 record. Sporting a 9-to-1 record, Oklahoma will make its fourth appearance. There'll be plenty of excitement at the Cotton Bowl, too, where Texas Christian will be battling it out with the Air Force Academy. The Texans have made it with an 8-to-2 this year, and the Air Force Academy is the Cinderella team of college football, with nine wins, no losses, and one tie to date. No matter where you go, no matter what else you're doing on New Year's Day, here's CBS Radio's on-the-spot broadcast of the Orange Bowl and Cotton Bowl games. All through that night, I sat on her porch and kept watch, seeing their torches, hearing the voice of Mulrooney haranguing the townspeople, working them up. But they didn't come. And inside, the doctor worked with her patients. It was after dawn when she came out to me. Still quiet? Oh, well. Mulroney is still working on them like a witch doctor. There's breakfast inside. You'd better eat something. I'll stand guard for a while. Thanks. How's Mrs. Benson? She'll be all right after she gets some rest. And the baby? The fever broke last night. What does that mean? It isn't typhoid. Not typhoid? You sure? Yes. Well, how can you be certain? You've only been with her overnight. You still doubt me, don't you, Mr. Paladin? The symptoms are there. Symptoms can be ambiguous. Now get your breakfast. You need it. All right. Morning, Mr. Paladin. Well, Mrs. Benson... It's nice to see you up and around. I wish I could tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, no, no. No gratitude before breakfast. Baby's better, huh? Yes, much better. Hmm. Miss Benson. Hmm? Why does Mulroney hate you so much? Um, my husband died early on the trip. After a while, Mulrooney wanted me to marry him. Said it was God's will to care for widows. And he was the chosen messenger. I wouldn't let him near me. Then the baby got sick. Come outside. What is it? They're coming. Look. I'll handle them. Go inside with Mrs. Benson. No, maybe I can help. You take care of your patients. You may have some new ones. I want to stay. All right, but stand back. That's far enough, Mulrooney. This torch is the fire of truth and justice, Paladin. It will burn away the seeds that Clara Benson has spread among us. It will scourge the disease from our souls and bodies and purify these homes again. The only disease is in you, Mulrooney. Mrs. Benson is well, and the baby is out of danger. Lies! In the very face of judgment... Mulroney, I'm giving you 15 seconds to drop that torch and call off those rifles. The flames of the just will vanish this scourge. Let the fires rage in the land of... You have 10 seconds. Wait! Listen, all of you. That baby never had typhoid fever. Don't believe her. I saw the child raging with fever, livid with rash. That rash was measles! Three-day measles! You're lying. Three-day measles, Mr. Mulrooney. And you left them to die because of it. Mrs. Benson, bring the baby out. No, it's not true. You're trying to humiliate me, to belittle me. You'll see. All of you. The fever is down. The rash has faded. Her eyes are bright. There, look. Look at her, Mulrooney. You can kill people with hate. But not with three-day measles. <laughs> Mulrooney, three-day measles. <laughs> Stop! Stop it! You can't! 
can't laugh at me! <laughs> Paladin! Well, Rudy, don't be a fool. I'm going to kill you, Paladin. I'm going to laugh at your grave. Let me see. There's no need. I think he's dead. You shoot very straight. Mr. Paladin. What do you want? Mr. Paladin. Well, I, I guess it was wrong to listen to him. He seemed to have so much book learning. But he was just setting us against each other. I'm glad we woke up in time. Next time, you better wake up a little sooner. Dr. Thackeray, this town hasn't been too good for you. Maybe you'd like to come along with me. They can always use a good doctor in San Francisco. Oh, please, ma'am. I guess we ain't been very friendly, but we'll make it up to you if you forgive us and stay. Well, Dr. Thackeray? Thanks, Mr. Paladin, for your offer. But there are too many of those velvet settees in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'll stay here where I'm needed. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Paladin. Good afternoon, hey boy. You get in late last night. Uh, sleep all day. Now up and feeling fine. I do indeed. Oh, you have good time with Lady Cleo? Lady Cleo? Lady will send for you, mm. you know. Oh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'd forgotten about her. Oh, sure. Uh, I met a lady who was much more charming. A lady doctor. Oh, sure. Yeah. As a matter of fact... I've had a fine case of three-day measles. Oh, yeah, the three-day measles. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's true. Oh, oh. Uh, you got dirty laundry. Uh, you put out tonight. Uh, to coin a phrase, hey, boy. Oh, sure. <laughs> Gun Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe. Is produced and directed by Norman McDonald. And stars John Daner as Paladin. With Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Don Brinkley. And adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Gene Bates, and Lou Krugman. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Chantel wrote in saying, I had fairly aggressive postpartum depression three years ago. I work as a reservist in the Canadian Armed Forces and full-time as a correctional officer. I didn't know about the Weird Darkness podcast when I was dealing with my postpartum. However, due to my past medical history and my two jobs that almost guarantee me to have some type of mental illness in the future, I am glad that there is a soft place to fall other than the usual government-funded sites. Chantel is right. The organizations that we're raising funds for this month are all funded by donors like you and me who understand the importance of these resources being available. You can make a donation now of any amount by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Or click the link in the show notes. The 
the Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Harden Wilkin Company. One moment, please. Good afternoon, Harden Wilkin Company. Mr. Wilkin is talking on another line. Will you wait, please? Good afternoon, Harden Wilkin Company. No. No, I don't want any of it. Our advertising must pay for itself. I haven't any money to throw away on questionable charity. Goodwill be hanged. That doesn't put black ink in my ledger. No, tell them to peddle their magazine space somewhere else. I haven't any use for it. Hmm. I didn't make my money to give it away. I have enough brains to make it. Let's hope I'll continue to have enough brains to keep it. Hello? Yes, Wills. Republic, 70,000 units, yes. American, 140,000 units. Standard, 95,000. That's grand, Wills. Huh? Well, never mind about that. You just bring in the orders. I'll take care of filling them on time. Yeah? Yep. Right. 305,000 units in one day. <laughs> I knew this invention would bring me a fortune. Over three million units the first year. Harden Wilgen, a millionaire in three years. A millionaire. That's all that counts. <laughs> a millionaire. All right, there's a more. Pull up. Right. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Hello. So what you got? Another John Doe for you. John Doe, huh? Yeah. All right, bring him in. All right. <laughs> you got that in, Bill? Yeah. Go ahead. Where is he from? Out by Coleman Swamp. Drowned? Nope. How then? I don't know. Coroner had a look at him? Yeah. Performed an autopsy and still on a high dive. Here, put him on here and we'll wheel him in. A little higher. Okay. Uh, how come he's a John Doe? Not a mark of identification on him. Labels torn off his clothes, even the buttons ripped off. Murder, huh? Looks like it. The question is, how? Poison? Coroner says not. Analysis showed no trace of poison. Say, Alec, uh... Do we have to go back any farther with you? Why? I don't like this place. Hey, you've been to the morgue enough times for it not to bother you. It always does. I want to get out into the fresh air. Good thing my nose don't bother me. Well, okay, you can leave him here. I'll take care of him. Coroner will be in tomorrow, Alec. All right. I'll just check him in and wait for the coroner. That's right. Come on, let's get out of here. John Doe. Always bothers me when they bring them in. When they're not identified, they end up in Potter's Field. Seems to me a feller's soul just don't rest right when he's buried in Potter's Field as John Doe. I suppose when the names are read off, he'll know which one to answer to and it'll be all right. But until then, I just can't see how his soul could rest peaceful. Now, let's see now. Uh, you'll take number nine, please. There. There, John Doe, number nine. John Doe, number nine. What? John Doe, number nine. Who, who, who's talking? <laughs> I must be hearing things. This place always did have strange echoes. Maybe the souls that got separated from their bodies too quick. I 
hope someone claims you, John Doe number nine. I, Stanley Creighton, now John Doe number nine, destined for Potter's Field to rest among the nameless. Harden Wilgen saw to it that identification was impossible. Harden Wilgen, I thought he was my friend. <laughs> my friend. I know now that he never intended to share the proceeds of the invention with me. He was just waiting until I had it perfected. How was I to know when he handed me the drink that afternoon a month ago that it was the first step toward Potter's Field? It was in the little shack in Coldman Swamp where he'd gone for privacy. Wilgen said, Nearly finished, Stanley? Yes, Wilgen. And it's going to work this time. It's going to work. Good. What have you been doing in the kitchen? Just mixing up a little celebration drink. You chemists are always mixing up some new concoction. Well, here, stop a moment and try it. All right. Smell good while you were making it. It is good. Hmm. It is at that. What is it? Made mostly of herbs that grow around the cabin here. Swell. Now, hold your breath. I'm all ready to try the unit. You uh, hook those two connections to the battery while I get the thermometer attached. Now, uh, X goes to the positive terminal. Ah, uh, where's that ammeter? I guess here it is. Ready? Ready. Connections tight? As tight as the clamps will hold. We're ready, then. I'll switch it on. Motor's running perfectly. Yes. Watch the thermometer. It's taking a nosedive already. Down 15 degrees. And look at the ammeter. The motor's drawing less than three amps of current. The experiment is successful, then? Of course it's successful. The unit will completely cool an automobile in less than half an hour and will keep it cool as long as needed. The motor draws less than three amps. That's less than a car radio. The unit can be run off the car battery indefinitely? Of course it can. All the battery needs is normal charging. Harden, the Wilgen Creighton unit is ready for the market. Hmm. <laughs> the Wilgen unit. Uh, let's drink on it. Our fortunes are made. Wilgen, we're rich. Of course we'll drink on it. <laughs> Bring on your witch's brew. <laughs> That's a good name for it, Stanley. In case the motor is we've planned and you won't hear a sound from it. Here we are, Stanley. To riches and easy living. To the successful marketing of the Wilgen Creighton unit. And then, on to more inventions. Hmm. <sighs> hey, you'll have to tell me how you make that drink. It has a bitter taste that I like. Yes, I'll tell you. Stanley, are you sure the unit is perfect? Wilgen, I'd stake my life on its perfect performance. Hmm. That's a high stake. That's how sure I am that it will do the work. The next thing is to get the necessary patents. You have all the papers, haven't you? Yes. Why don't we draw them up now? Why not wait till the morning? We'll do that first thing. All right. <sighs> I, I feel a little sleepy. Do you? I... I think I'll turn in in a few minutes. Might be a good idea. I'm not very sleepy. I think I'll sit up a while. That drink seems to have gone to my head. In what way? How do you feel? Very dizzy. Uh -huh. My head feels very heavy. Not as heavy as it will feel in a few more minutes. What do you mean? Is it supposed to work that way? Yes. It is supposed to work that way. Why do you say it that way? Stare at me the way you do. <laughs> the witch's brew. That was a good name you gave the drink. Don't you feel dizzy, too? No. I didn't drink it. Didn't drink it? No. <laughs> the witch's brew. Why are you staring at me that way? Wilkin, you haven't... Yes, I have. I've poisoned you. You devil. <laughs> Try to get at me. Try to use your limbs. I, I can't. Your head's getting heavier. Why did you do this? Whose money is going to market this invention? Mine. You wouldn't have anything to market but for me. And whose solution are you using in the freezer? I told you what mixture to use. The Wilgen unit is going to make a fortune. The Wilgen unit, not the Wilgen Creighton uh, unit. Wilgen, don't do this. Give me an antidote. There's no antidote known. I wouldn't if I could. I'll go away. I won't lay any claim to the invention. For heaven's sake... Don't kill me just to get it all for yourself. You'll go away. I've made sure of that. Wilgen, I can hardly see you. Give me an antidote. Save my life. You can't be so inhuman. The poison is made from two common herbs that grow here in the swamp. 
It's been known for centuries. In 24 hours, there will be no trace of it left in your body. With all identification marks removed from your clothes and no relatives to come sticking in their noses. That was convenient, Stanley. You not having any relatives. <laughs> Go ahead, writhe. In a few moments, when the poison is ready to overpower the heart, you will jump like a jack-in-a-box. They will find your body in a swamp, Stanley, near a spot I know of where the ground is hard. Won't leave footprints. <laughs> kick. Go on, kick. This was the only sure way. This unit is going to make me a fortune, and I'm not going to share it. It's over. He's dead. No one will ever know who he is or how he died. <laughs> ah, life is going to be easy now. Riches, luxury, and I'm safe. They'll never trace this to me. They won't know who he is. Got to get him out of here. Drag him outside, then see if I can lift him. Got to get out of here. Got to get out of here. many echoes in this room tonight. <coughs> what was that? Got to get out of here. Too many echoes of lost souls in the morgue. <coughs> it's number nine. I swear, I saw his hand move. <coughs> it is moving. It is. <coughs> it, it raised his head up and, and looked at me. <coughs> number nine is getting up out of his coffin. Not to get out of here. Talking. I, I hear him playing. Help! Help! The damn woman is talking! Help! Help! John Doe, number nine. Got to get out of here. Got to get out of here. John Doe, number nine. Got to get out of here, John Doe. <laughs> A dead man gets up off the slab in the morgue and is now wandering through the city streets. Where is he going? What is he going to do? <laughs> the hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> Company is the third door to your right, sir. I know. Third door to right. Hmm. What's the matter with that guy? Good morning, Harden Wilkin 
company. Just a moment. I'll have to look it up. I'll call you back in a few moments, Mr. Andrews. Yes, sir. What did you wish? Harden Wilgen. This is the Harden Wilgen Company. I want to see Harden Wilgen. Whom shall I say is calling? John Doe. What's that? I am called John Doe. Mr. Wilgen knows me. He knows me. What did you wish to see Mr. Wilgen about? The Wilgen unit. Just a moment, then. I'll call Mr. Wilgen and find out if he can see you. Mr. Wilgen and Mr. Doe... Wait a minute, sir. You can't go into his office yet. Oh, look. Look, there's that man. He, he walked right through the door. He didn't open the door. He walked right through it. Help! Oh, come here and help. Oh, help. Everything's getting black. Help. Grace. Hello, hello. What's wrong with that girl? Who wants me, did you say? John Doe, number nine. Oh. What? I want you, Wilgen. I, John Doe, number nine. You remember John Doe, number nine, don't you, Wilgen? Stanley. Stanley Creighton. I am John Doe, number nine. For a moment, I... I thought you were Stanley Creighton. You look like Stanley Creighton. John Doe, now. Number nine. How did you get in here? What do you want? You... Harden Wilgen. I want you. Get out of here. Get out of my office. Who are you? You know me, Wilgen. You remember the witch's brew? Stanley. You remember now. Stanley Creighton is dead. You're an imposter. No Get out. longer am I Stanley Creighton. You saw to that. I'm John Doe number nine. My residence is the morgue. My resting place, a cold slab of marble. Get out of my sight! Look at my hands in the daylight, Wilgen. They're turning black. The blood is drained from my body. Go stop! Look. Look, Wilgen. See? Here is the long slash on my body. The autopsy revealed no poison. You were right. Your crime was clever. You reckoned with everything but me. Get away! It'll do you no good to call for help, Wilgen. You've come face to face with me. Your face is white hot now, too. Like mine. Your heart is burning with fear. Your time on earth is almost drained away. Help! Your mouth is dry and parched, Wilgen. You feel dizzy. No. Try to use your limbs. You can't. A glass of water sitting in front of you. You need water. Yes. Drink it, Wilgen, drink. <coughs> it wasn't water, Wilgen. Poison. What? You hear me? Poison. You have drunk poison. Oh, help! Help! I'm, I'm, I'm choking. I can't... can't breathe. I... I... You'll speak no more. It's all over, Wilgen. You reckoned with everything but John Doe and death. I, John Doe, number nine. My work is done. John Doe, number nine. John Doe, number nine. John. I found her just like this, Doc, lying on the floor. She just fainted, that's all. She'll be all right in a moment. I thought I heard someone call help. It sounded like it came from the Wiggins Company, and so I ran in and found her lying on the floor. Then I ran down to your office, Doc. Oh. Well, she's going to be all right. Take a drink of this, please. Oh, she was calling help. help. That's what she's saying now. Mr. Wilgen. Mr. Wilgen. What about Mr. Wilgen? A man... A man who said his name was John Doe walked right through the door. Walked through it. I saw him. He what? Don't you understand? He, he wasn't real. He vanished through the door into the office. Is this Mr. Wilgen's private office? Yes. He vanished through his door. I guess I'd better find out from Mr. Wilgen what this is all about. 
Mr. Wilgen. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Wilgen, but... Wait. What's wrong here? Uh, come in here, quickly. What's wrong, Doc? <gasps> Mr. Wilgen is... The man is dead. 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 The man? The strange-looking man? He, he walked through the door, came in here and killed Mr. Wilgen. There are no wounds. Must have been his heart. I have never seen such a look on anyone's face before. He died in horror. Terrible horror. I told you I can't stand this place, Alec. And it's worse at night. You think I like it after all that's happened? Well, what are you bringing me back for? I, I just gotta see. I gotta see. You talk like a wild man. I think I'm losing my mind. Here. We're going to look at him. Who is it? You remember? John Doe, number nine? Yeah, I remember. He's lying here quiet now. Like all the dead lie. Sometimes you think you can see him breathing. Cut it, Alec. I heard him. I heard him speak. I saw him move last night. I saw it. You know... You know, you're plain nuts. Is that so? Well, listen. You saw the evening paper, didn't you? Sure, I saw it. You read about Harden Wilgen, didn't you? Yeah, I read it. Died in his office today. Sure he did. The coroner says it was just a case of heart attack. No signs of murder. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about? They didn't bring the body of Harden Wilgen to the morgue. No. But you read about the girl in his office, didn't you? How she says a strange-looking fellow came in the Wilkin Company, said his name was John Doe, and how he walked right through the door. They say she was seeing things. Well, what, what about it? And listen, you know what I think? It was this John Doe, him, lying here. He walked into that office. Alec, Alec, you are crazy. Crazy, am I? Dead bodies lying in morgues. Well, they don't get up and walk out in the streets. You don't think they do. No one thinks so. But me? I think so. Now I do. I tell you, I saw this John Doe number nine move on the slab last night. I heard him speak. I've always said a man buried as John Doe didn't rest easy in his grave. I want to get out of here. This one didn't rest easy. Even before we put him in the potter's field. It's like he really didn't die at all. And look at him now. Lying here. Quiet. Quiet and somehow peaceful. You know, he even looks different than he did last night. Sort of... Like he'd gone to sleep in death. As mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show. 
behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. country town of Menden. According to the newspaper accounts, the man who was at first believed to be guilty of the crime was allowed to go free, but no satisfactory reason was given. I reread the published stories and learned that on the evening of February 26th, a farmer named Walt Centrell was late for his supper. That you, Walt? Yes, yeah, it's me. Well, set the milk down in the shed and come into your supper. Been on the table more than an hour. Walt? All right, all right, I'm a coming. Can't you give a man time to wash his hands? Oh, wash his hands. Man's sakes, he's had time to take a whole bath, let alone wash his hands. Oh, the way you nag, Marcy's enough to set a man's nerves on it. The way I nag. Mm. Well, my sense is, Walt Sandfell. You've been out in that there barn long enough to milk 40 cows instead of just two. Now sit down and eat your supper. Who said I've been milking all the time? Agnes is sick. Man just can't sit around and let one of his critters suffer. Yeah, it seems to me you haven't been doing much to help her. How much milk was there? Seven quarts. Seven quarts, my land. Walt, the thing to do is either call in Duck Halliday or get rid of Agnes. Now, we can't afford... Listen, listen. Sounds like Ed's drunk again. No! Oh, they're at it again. How she does put up with him, I don't know. Such neighbors. I declare, if I were Marion Blake, I'd do something about that there husband of hern. I declare I would. Any husband who beats his wife ought to be put away. Oh, it's harmless. He's just a drunken, no good bum. <laughs> Listen to that, Martha. Yeah, I'm a listening. My senses, I've been a listening ever since Ed Blake brought that new wife of his into Mendon a year ago. And every time I boil inside, Walt. We ought to do something. Now, it's none of our business. What can we do? We can report to Constable Finn McNutt. That's what we can do. Yeah, we did that once, and what good did it do? Well, it did plenty of good. Finn talked to Ed, didn't he? Finn told him if it happened again, he'd take steps now, didn't he? Uh, steps? Martha, you don't know about them things. Unless Martha Marion registers a complaint, taking steps won't do no good. Well, then I think that we... Oh. Walt Santrell, I'm going over there. I'm certainly not going to sit here and listen to that. Why, he'll you kill the still. Point. It's none of your business. You keep your nose where it belongs. I won't. I don't care if I don't know her very well. I'm a woman, and she's a woman, and it's my You duty. sit still, I say. For all you know, she likes being beat up by her man. Some women are like that, to tell me. Oh, if you could have seen that there little mite of a thing this morning, you wouldn't be talking such nonsense. Seen her this morning? Did you see her? I most certainly did. She come a-calling said she wanted to borrow some flour. But that was only an excuse. She knew it and I knew it. What she wanted to do was to talk. What'd she talk about? Well, what do you think she talked about? She talked about her husband, of course. Mm. He's drunk more than half the time, she said. And when she tries to reason with him, he hits her. Oh, it's terrible. And she doesn't know what to do. She's scared half to death, the poor little mice. Well, that settles it. I'm going over there. And if you're not man enough to come with me, Walt Santrell, you can just stay Now, here. wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get your dander up. I'll go along with you. Well, come along, then. My lad, I've had all of this I can stand. Marcy, this ain't none of our business. Well, I'm making it my business. Go back home if you want to, Walt Santrell. I'm going to see... All right, all right. You talk too much. Not here. 
Now, the best thing we can do is go along home and forget the whole business. Not me. I started this thing, and I'm going through with it. Uh, uh, see? The door's open. That means they're home, don't it? Well, why should it? Nobody in Menden ever locks your doors. You're just using that as an excuse. Oh, stop being so logical and keep quiet. Mrs. Blake? Oh, Mrs. Blake? Oh, uh, there's no one here now? Now, be still. Where are you going? Out into the kitchen, of course. That's where the sounds come from, didn't they? Where else would I look? Look? Look for what? <gasps> My goodness. Oh, Walt. What's the matter? What are you staring at? It's, uh, it's oh. poor Mrs. Blake. Look at her lying there on the floor. He's knocked her unconscious. Oh, I knew he would. The brute. Well, well the stop brute. your jabbering and do something. What shall I do? What can we do? Get some water from the sink <laughs> and a towel. Good heavens, woman, stop your no, jabbering. Oh, that's... Bruce, that Bruce, that poor little kid. Knocked out cold. Wonder what happened. I'll get some ammonia. Just plain water. Won't... Walt, what's the matter? We won't be needing ammonia, Marthy, or anything else. She's dead. <laughs> Bart, tell me just one thing. Are we up here to investigate a murder, or are we just out for the ride? Well, let's say we're riding out to investigate a murder, Inspector. Now, that's what I call a smart comeback. Yes, <laughs> sir. That's a dilly. Ha, ha, ha. Inspector, there used to be a day when you had a sense of humor. What happened to it? I've still got it. Just say something funny. Hmm? All right. Have you heard the story about the man who at Christmas time asked his neighbor what he was going to get for his wife? No. No? Well, the neighbor replied, uh, I don't know. I haven't had any offers. Anyhow, <laughs> Inspector, that's a very imposing-looking jail, is it? I haven't had any offers. Now, let me see. How old was I the first time I heard yeah, that? Come on, you old southwest. Don't pretend you've heard it before. Let's go in and have a talk with this constable, Finn McNutt. Haven't had any offers okay, yet. Okay, Inspector, you win. However, hey. I should... Oh, there's someone at the end of the porch. Let's go over, Inspector. It's probably Constable McNutt. That guy must be 90. Don't tell me he's the constable of this town. You fellas looking for someone? Yes. Are you Constable Finn McNutt? Huh? I can't hear you. I'm deep as a headache. Oh. I said we're looking for Constable Finn McNutt. He ain't here. Do you know when he'll be back? Who? McNutt. How do you want to see him for? I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Danton. Drake? Well, why didn't you say so? My name's McNutt. Finn McNutt. Hey... <coughs> Come on inside. I got something to show you. Well, how do you like that, that deaf old coot? Who's a deaf old coot? Don't you call me a deaf old coot, bub. What? Well, I... I ain't old and I ain't deaf. That's what I want to be. And by the way, which one of you gents is Inspector Danton? Which one? Well, look, Gramp, if he's Drake, I must be Danton. Oh, smart guy, huh? Well, I'm going to show you fellas you ain't so smart coming up here trying to show us county constables how dumb we are. Wait a minute, we didn't... Don't talk back to me, bub. You want to work on this case, you'll do as I say. Hear me? By golly, in a minute... You hear me? Sure, I hear you only... All right, then. Talk when you spoke to. Not until. Now, which one of you gents is Drake? (laughs) I'm Drake, Mr. McNutt. Oh, yeah. Now, why didn't you say so? Now, look here, Drake. I've been reading about you in the newspapers. You and that other fella, what's his name? Uh, Danton, Scranton, or some foreign name like that. That does it, Bart. Are you going to tell this Billy Whiskers where to head in, or am I? Eh? What was that? You you got something to say, Bob? Speak up. I'll speak up, all right. Now, listen, you <laughs> long whiskered. <laughs> uh, let's forget personal grievances for the moment and find out about this murder. Murder? What murder? Who said there'd been a murder? I did. It was in all the newspapers. Don't you ever read the papers? You ain't a fool of me, none. I know that's why you're here. Because I sent a clip to Drake. And who dang well he couldn't stay away. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bart, what is this? Did this joker send you a newspaper clipping? Uh, yes, he did, Inspector. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it to you. So that's it. You dragged me way up here on a two-bit murder case and then... That ain't why Drake come up here, bub. That ain't why at all, is it, Mr. Drake? Well, uh, no, as a matter of fact, it isn't. Uh, you bet it isn't. Um, ain't a mean... It's because I let the prisoner go, ain't it, Mr. Drake? Yes, that's it. According to all the newspaper accounts, it was pretty well established that Ed Blake had beaten his wife to death. And then suddenly you allowed the prisoner to go free. Frankly, I'd like to know why. I knew you'd ask me. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Well, tell us, tell us, tell us. You better tell you. I'll show you city fellas I ain't so dumb. 
I let Ed go because he ain't guilty, that's why. Well, that's a simple enough answer, isn't it, Bart? Hmm. Why do you think Ed isn't guilty, then? Because Mary and Blake was poisoned, that's why. Poisoned? You yeah, bet she was. Look here. Here's what I wanted to show you. Hmm? Take a look at that paper. All right. Ah, I see. A medical report stating that Marion Blake died of arsenic poison. That's right. That's what killed her, all right. Arsenic poison. That there paper proved it. This is very interesting, Mr. McNutt, but how did you know that... Say, wait a minute. This report is signed by F.T. McNutt, M.D. Is Dr. McNutt related to you, Constable? Related? Why, doggone it, I'm him. But you're Dr. McNutt? Sure I am, bub. I've been a doctor for 62 years. There's my certificate right there on the wall. Don't you ever have much truck with it, though. My hand's too shaky lately. Folks don't have confidence in the sawbones with a shaky hand. Spend most of the time these days being constable. Well, cut off my bangs and call me Bob. How's that, Junior? Constable, I think I'm beginning to see what's behind all this. Um, being a doctor, you probably have some arsenic lying around your office. That's it, Drake. I guess you were kind of smart at that. Thank you, sir. Last week, uh, some of that there arsenic was stole. Well, sir, the only one who's died around here in more than a year is Marion Blake. So, you put two and two together, eh? Yeah. Only in this case, two and two make five. How was that? Well, sir, I performed an autopsy, see? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, Ms. Blake was dead of arsenic poisoning. How does that make two and two equal five? You keep quiet, Junior, and listen. You might learn something. The arsenic was stole one day and returned the next. During the time it was gone... Mary and Blake was poisoned. So you reasoned that whoever stole the arsenic decided to return it in the hopes that you wouldn't notice its brief absence, hmm? Yeah, maybe. Hey, Drake, I reckon you want to know what made me suspicious in the first place, eh? Yes, yes, and I would. Well, sir, it's simple. Ed Blake wasn't in no condition to beat his wife to death, that's why. Why wasn't he? Because he was stuck drunk, that's why. Because he wasn't to home when them Chantrell said they heard him beating her, that's why. He wasn't at home. Are you sure? You're dang tootin', I'm sure. Ed Blake was asleep right here in my office from six o'clock that night till midnight. and how it was given to Marion Blake, and I'll pay you $1,000 cash money. Well, this is uh, rather unusual, Constable, being offered money by the police department. It ain't being offered by the police department. No? Being offered by me, personal. As soon as folks find out the facts in this case, they're going to figure it was me that murdered Marion. Figure it was you who murdered her. Why, sure. Ed and me hated each other. Everybody knows that. He claims I killed a cow, his not that I tried to doctor once. Said the critter was a purebred, and I owed him $2,000. So last week, he got drunk and came over to your office and tried to collect it, hmm? Is that right, Constable? That's it. We had some words, and the folks gathered around outside. To... I ups and rest Ed for disturbing the peace. And how about it, Drake? You want that 1000 bucks, or don't you? I'll take the case, Constable, but not because I think you intend paying me $1,000. Frankly, my only purpose will be to satisfy my own curiosity as to why you've gone to all this trouble to tell us such a deliberate lie. Well, I declare, Mr. Drake, I don't know what Finn McNutt is talking about, I'm sure. I think he must be getting senile. So, why do you say that, Mrs. Central? Why? Well, my goodness, Mr. Drake, Walt and I ain't deaf. We know when we hear something. Then you still insist that you heard sounds of a struggle in the Blake's kitchen on the night you found her dead. Well, my land... Now, look here, Drake. Of course we heard it. We've been hearing it for almost a year. What could possibly be the object in this both land of you? That's what puzzles me. It doesn't puzzle me. Hmm? That Billy Whiskers constable was thinking him up as he went along. But why, Inspector? Why would he make up such a cock and bull story he knew we could check it easy enough? Yeah, that's right. And to make it worse... He's willing to pay us a thousand bucks to prove he's a liar. What? Uh, what was that you said, Inspector? Dunn? I said that McNutt offered us a thousand dollars to prove him a liar. Oh, my senses. That certainly is funny. A thousand dollars. What's funny about it? Just a minute, Inspector. Mrs. Santrell, 
You mentioned a minute ago that Mrs. Blake called on you the morning of the murder. Yes. She said she'd come to borrow some flour, but I knew that was only an excuse. We talked about that husband of hers the whole time. Come along, Inspector. Let's go over and have a talk with Ed Blake. <laughs> The Ed Blake splitting wood out in his backyard. Oh, yes. Let's go over. Good afternoon. Are you Ed Blake? Yeah, that's right. Guess you two are Drake and Danton. Been expecting you. News gets around in these small towns, doesn't it? Mr. Blake, I guess uh, you know why we're here. Yeah, Ben told me. Personally, I think you're wasting your time. Marion committed suicide. Ben thinks otherwise. As long as he does, I'm willing to help out by answering your questions. What makes you say your wife committed suicide, Mr. Blake? That's a personal matter, and it's none of your business. Thought you were going to answer our question. Never mind, Inspector. I think I know the answer. Blake, if your wife had committed suicide, there'd be a box or uh, some sort of container lying nearby which held the arsenic she used. Did you uh, find any such container? I don't know. The arsenic was stolen from Finn McNutt's office, and later the unused portion was returned there. Finn says you were asleep in his office from 6 o'clock until midnight. Did uh, Finn say that? Mm-hmm. Didn't we just tell you he said it? I don't know whether you fellas are trying to trick me or not. I don't know if it makes any difference. Finn probably thought he'd help me by lying. Poor old guy. You mean you weren't in the office all the time? No. Around 7, I got up and went out to look for another bottle. Where'd you look? Not out here, if that's what you're thinking. I didn't come near this house all that day or evening. Oh, just a minute. We've got two witnesses who will swear they heard you and your wife fighting. Who are they? Walt and Martha Santrell? <laughs> They're always hearing things. Their testimony in court will carry a lot of weight, Blake. No more than my witnesses. I got witnesses who'll testify I wasn't anywhere near this house at the time of Santrell said they heard me beating up my wife. Who are they? I'll produce them when the time You'll comes. You'll produce them now unless you want to be arrested for the murder of your wife. That's so? Who's going to arrest me? I am. Not without Finn McNutt's permission. Finn's got charge of this case, and it just happens he knows I didn't murder nobody. You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Sure I am. Here comes Finn now. You can ask him if he wants you to arrest me. I'm going to ask him plenty of things. Uh, I wouldn't, Inspector. I think we're going to find that Mr. McNutt is a lot smarter than we gave him credit. Hello there. Hello, Mr. McNutt. How are you? Howdy, Drake. Hello, Ed. Hiya, friend. Who's that there, fella? Now, (laughs) don't give us that routine again, Longbeard. You know darn well who I am. Well, dang my eyes if it ain't old gumshoe Scranton. Well, Drake... You got everything fixed up? Yes, yes, I think so, Finn. Uh, know who done it, huh? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, Finn. <laughs> I figured you would. I'm sorry I had to pull a couple of fast ones to help things along. I guess you and me uh, understand each other, though, don't we? We're beginning to, I'm sure. <laughs> you betcha. Well, let's get over to the sand trails and let them know how smart I am. <laughs> My senses, this is certainly turning into quite an affair, ain't it? Sorry we had to bother you again, Mrs. Santrell, but Finn seems to think you'd both be interested in the final outcome of the case. I don't get it. What's the idea, Finn? Oh, let Drake tell you. Me? I'm just an old hick cop that don't know nothing. You can say that again, Gramp. All right, I will. I don't know nothing. Now, Drake, you tell him, boy. All right, I'll do my best, Finn. Look, uh, Blake... Do you still insist that you weren't at your house between 6 o'clock and midnight on the night of the murder? Sure I do. And if the sand trails say any different, they're crazy. Why, the idea, the very idea. You were there, Ed Blake. We heard you. Yeah. Why, we could have heard you if you'd been a mile away. Now, wait a minute. Are you sure you heard Blake, Mrs. Santrell? Or did you just hear Mrs. Blake? You just hear Marion? Oh. Uh, why, uh, I don't know what you mean. Sure we heard Ed. We both heard him. Uh, we were... Wait a minute now, Walt. Wait a minute. Uh, I think Mr. Drake's got something there. Now, just let me think. What do you mean, got something? We heard him, I tell you. No, no, we didn't. Hmm. I remember now. No, sir, we didn't. Huh. All we heard was Marion uh, begging Ed not to hit her. And then we heard some furniture being knocked over. 
Well, I declare. I don't blame you for being surprised, Mrs. Santrell. It would be only natural for you to assume that Ed Blake was beating his wife when she kept screaming and begging him not to. Blake, tell me, did you ever strike your wife at all? Yeah. Watch, though. The time I found out she was seeing Walt Santrell's secret. What was that, Ed Blake? Your husband yeah. was not only carrying on a romance with Marion Blake behind your back, Mrs. Santrell, but he had ample time to administer the poison to her while he was supposed to be out caring for a sick cow. That's a lie. I didn't give her the poison. Why should I? I was in love with her. Oh, Walt, Walt. It was Ed who gave her the poison. It must have been. How could it have been? He was asleep in the constable's office all the time. No, he wasn't. Marthy went down to get Finn after we discovered Marion's body. And there wasn't anyone in Finn's office. Was there, Marthy? Was there? No. There wasn't anyone there. I got to stick by you, Walt, even though... Even though... So there wasn't anyone there, eh? Not even Gramp here. That's right, Junior. I'm in it, too. It could have been me. Could have. Had plenty of chance. I told you folks would think I did it. Well, did you? Never you mind. Go on, Greek. Needle him, boy. Needle him. Are you quite sure there was no one in the constable's office when you got there after the murder, Mrs. Andrew? Yes, I'm sure. I, I'll testify in court if necessary. If it'll prove Walt innocent. I see. Now, if no one were there, you had an opportunity to return the partly used box of arsenic, didn't you? What did you say? What was that? You wondered how you were going to get it back, didn't you, Mrs. Santrell? You certainly didn't want such incriminating evidence found in your possession. And you were afraid that Finn might notice the box was missing if you kept it too long. Then came a golden opportunity when you went running for the police to investigate a murder that you yourself had committed. You don't mean... You can't Oh, mean. yes, I do mean, Mrs. Santrell. Another golden opportunity came to you when Marion Blake came over to borrow some flour. It solved a real problem, didn't it? Marthy, you didn't... Say, that's an angle. By golly... You keep quiet there, Gramp. Let Drake pay it off. Go ahead, boy. You loaned Marion Blake the flower, didn't you, Mrs. Santrell? You put arsenic in it. You knew she'd never noticed it, or that there was any likelihood of anyone guessing how the poison had been administered. Is it true, Marthy? Is it? Yes, it's true, Walt. I put the arsenic in the flower. I knew she'd make biscuits. I knew Ed was drunk and wouldn't be home. I knew about you and Marion. I I thought you'd be over there eating supper with her. You have before. I watched you. I wanted you both to die. I wanted you both to die. And then I wanted to die myself. <laughs> It says, leaving Menden. Come back and see us again. Only I'm not coming back. <laughs> You're still a little hot under the collar, Inspector? No, I'm not hot under the collar. Only these country cops get in my hair. Yeah, you'll have to admit that Finn McNutt was pretty smart, Inspector. Mark my foot. All he was was the doggondest liar I ever ran across. <laughs> Everyone in Menden seemed to do pretty well at throwing whoppers. Yeah. Imagine those Santrells cooking up that story about hearing their next-door neighbors fighting. Yeah, that wasn't a cooked-up story, Inspector. Martha Santrell actually did think Blake was beating up his wife. But Santrell knew that Marion Blake was putting on an act, eh? Exactly. It would have provided excellent grounds for divorce, Inspector, since both Santrell and Martha would have sworn they heard the beatings. See? Ah, me. What lengths some people go to to get rid of their spouses. Yes, they certainly do, Inspector. And that's another thing I can't figure. If Constable Longbeard was so smart, what did he want us in on the case for? Why didn't he just go out and arrest Martha Santrell? But he didn't know that Martha Santrell was guilty, Inspector. He only knew that Marion Blake had died of arsenic poison. And that, that scared him. Scared him? Yes. Remember, his job as constable was virtually honorary. And Ed Blake had already been arrested for his wife's murder. Uh, McNutt didn't want to stick his chin out, That's eh? it, Inspector. He had his pride. And he didn't want to lose his job as constable. It was his only source of income. 
He knew people would laugh at him if he tried to sell anyone the idea that Marion Blake had been poisoned. But he figured a couple of city cops had swallow it hook, line, and sinker, eh? Well, he kidded us into taking the job, Inspector. He had enough evidence to prove his poisoning theory, but not enough to convict anyone. You've got to admit he was clever about it. Oh, sure, sure, I'll admit it. Good for you, Inspector. Only I'd give my badge for a chance to go back there and pull his whiskers. <laughs> I think he'd let you do it, too. He's so pleased with the way things turned out. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> He was kind of cute at that. You know what he said just before we left? Well, I know he apologized to you for all the cracks he'd made. He said he tried to make us both mad so we'd stick around and pull his chestnuts out of the fire. I don't mean that. I mean... Oh, you mean when he yelled after us that from now on his new slogan was going to be, Mystery is my hobby. We all know someone who struggles with depression, whether we realize it or not. It's something that those who suffer tend to deal with in silence, in the shadows. But the organizations we're supporting with our annual Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser this month are working to make it easier for those in the darkness to come into the light, to find help, and to learn that they're not alone, that there are ways to overcome the darkness and live normal lives. I'm evidence of that myself. I, too, suffer from depression. I do this fundraiser only one month out of the year, because October is the anniversary month for Weird Darkness, beginning October 1, 2015. It's also National Depression Awareness Month, and it's already spooky and dark. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month to help people climb out of their personal darkness. If you'd like to make a donation, learn more about the fundraiser, or watch a video about it that I made, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween night at midnight. Please, give what you can. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. I suppose your dinner is well over by now, so now's the perfect time to get out a bottle of that swell Petri California port. You know, Petri port was just made for a time like this, after dinner when you're just taking things easy. If you've ever tasted Petri port, you know what I mean. It's a hearty, full-bodied wine with a deep red color and a flavor that's just about out of this world. I think that if you had only one wine to choose and the whole world to choose from, chances are you'd pick port. Petri port. That's how good I think it is. That's saying plenty, I know, but I think Petri port will easily live up to all I say about it. Try it and see. And share it with your friends. You can serve Petri port proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's visit our old friend, Dr. Watson. Well, I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Foreman. Tell one out and, and join me. Admiring the sunset, eh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's a particularly beautiful one. Well, where are the puppies this evening? Uh, asleep on a, a favorite treat coat of mine. It's just come back from the cleaner. <laughs> and you hadn't the heart to move them, I suppose. No, no, I hadn't. The little fellows looked so comfortable. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these... Uh, but you haven't come here to listen to a dissertation on the behavior of dogs? Well, it is getting near story time, Doctor. Yes, of course it is. Well, just let me uh, get my pipe properly lighted. Ah, that's it. The story I'm going to tell you tonight began in 1909. 
I received a telegram from my old friend telling me that he was leaving his Sussex bee farm and coming to London for a few days. I haven't seen the great man for several months, so naturally I went to Victoria Station to meet him. As the train drew to a stop, the door of a first-class carriage swung open and Sherlock Holmes, hand outstretched, jumped down onto the platform to greet me. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? Oh, Holmes, my dear fellow, it's good to see you again. I've missed you. And are you well, chap? Harry Bates, sir? Uh, yes, Porter, and get us a handsome cab, will you? Right, you are, Governor. I wish I'd got a spare room for you. Don't worry, Watson, I shall be very comfortable at the Diogenes Club. By the way, I trust you're free this evening. Yes, naturally. What are your plans? I thought we'd go to the theatre. The theatre? Oh, what play do you want to see? Well, I thought we'd go to the Savoy Theatre and see the Sherlock Holmes play. I hear it's enormously successful. Yes, I know it is, but I've avoided it. I'm told that Sir Claude Horton takes great liberties with your character, and as for the actor portraying me, my friends tell me it's a, it's a travesty. He makes me nothing but a uh, bumbling old fool. <laughs> Therefore, a visit to the play might be a salutary experience for both of us. In any case, my trip to London is in response to an urgent telegram from Sir Claude himself. Seems to need my help rather badly. Oh, uh, what's his trouble? <clears throat> well, he wasn't specific in his telegram. He suggested, however, that we attend tonight's performance and discuss the matter with him afterwards. I see. Well, I, I suppose if you can sit through it, I can. Of course you can, old fellow. In any case, you yourself are partly responsible for the play's existence. How do you mean, Holmes? <laughs> Those sensational stories you wrote of my modest problems, I I should have seen where they would eventually lead to. In time, no doubt, we shall uh, be portrayed on the cinematograph as well. Nonsense, Holmes. That newfangled thing's only a toy. I think not, Watson. We're on the edge of a strange new mechanical world. In fact, I begin to feel a certain concern about the rumored developments in wireless telegraphy. But enough of these predictions. Here comes our porter with a cab. We'll tell the driver to take us straight to the Savoy Theatre. Just look at that line of people at the box at the uh, box office home. Very flapping, old chap. Well, possibly, but I hope it doesn't mean that we've got to wait our turn. And... Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, aren't you? Yes, yes. I yes. thought I couldn't be mistaken. My name is Frank Ferris. I do, Mr. Ferris. I'm glad to meet you, sir. Sir Claude has a box reserved for you. He asked me to see that you are quite comfortable. Consider it of him. Will you follow me, please? Thank you. Um, neither of you have seen the play before, I understand. Uh, no, Mr. Ferris, we haven't. <laughs> I imagine it'll be a strange experience seeing yourselves portrayed on the stage. By the way, uh, I'm playing the part of an old friend of yours, Professor Moriarty. Oh, indeed. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a very entertaining evening. I presume that you escape our clutches, as usual? <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and I've done it nightly now for 137 performances. Oh, a record that I'm sure Professor, uh, Professor Moriarty himself would envy. Had it not been for his memorable demise at the Reichenbach Falls... Ah, here we are, gentlemen. This is the box reserved for you. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to my dressing room. Oh, oh, I nearly forgot, Mr. Holmes. Sir Claude asked me to give you this note. Thank you. Oh, not at all. Well, I'll see you later. Huh. Very nice fellow for an actor. Don't be a snob, Watson. Well, what does Sir Claude note say? I'll read it to you. Dear Holmes, since I telegraphed you yesterday, there have been strange developments. In fact, I've been doing some detective work off stage as well as on. Watch the performance tonight and watch the audience too, particularly the occupant of the box opposite yours. Please come to my dressing room as soon as the last curtain has fallen. Oh, he's being very mysterious, and the box opposite ours is empty. No, no, no. Look, Watson, look. Someone has just entered. Confound it. The house lights are going out. The first act's beginning, Holmes. The first act, yes. Well, sit back and relax, old fellow. Let's see what they've done to us. <laughs> What did you think of the first act, Holmes? Huh? Oh, the first act, yes, yes. I was um, examining the occupant of the box opposite ours. An attractive young lady, alone and unusually preoccupied in her program. In fact, one might assume that she was trying to hide her face. Yes, but the play, don't you think it's ridiculous? Just imagine a crown jewel being stolen from the Tower of London. Why not? It's been attempted many times. Anyhow, you must admit that the actor who's portraying me behaves like a, like a blithering idiot. <laughs> and Sir Claude's interpretation of you is uh, pretty far-fetched. Far-fetched, but flattering, Watson. What poise, what suavity, and what a voice. 
I find myself thoroughly entertained. You're a strange chap, Holmes. No accounting for your tastes. Look, Watson, look. The back of the box over there. Good Lord, I could have sworn a man dodged behind the curtain. I don't think the girl saw him, though. Looked like a foreigner. <laughs> I think as the young ladies alone, we'll take the liberty of joining her. Oh, dash it, there go the lights again. The second act starting now. And sit down, old fellow. We don't want to attract attention. We'll join her during the next intermission. What do you want with me? Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, young lady? I hope you'll forgive this intrusion, but Sir Claude requested that I keep an eye on you during the play tonight. Please come in and sit down, won't you? Thank you. Oh, this is very kind of you. You must forgive my abruptness just now. When I've just been watching Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson being impersonated on the stage, it's, it's rather startling to have the real couple walk into my box. <laughs> yes, I quite understand. By the way... Just before the curtain went up on the second act, I thought I noticed a man come into the back of this box and then disappear again. Were you aware of his presence? No. No, I didn't see him. But I know who it is. He's been following me for weeks now. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, Miss... Uh... Henshaw. Alicia Henshaw. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here tonight. Sir Claude Horton's an old friend of my father's. I went to ask his advice. He did some investigating himself for a few days, and then he found himself a little out of his depth, so he decided to telegraph for you, Mr. Holmes. We were going to meet in his dressing room after the performance tonight. Splendid. And now, Miss Henshaw, what is your story? It's a strange one, Mr. Holmes, though I didn't realize just how strange until I first saw this play a few nights ago. You see, my story concerns a stolen ruby. Good Lord, and tonight's play revolves around the same thing. Exactly. I might as well tell you how it all started. My brother was an officer in the British Army stationed in Egypt. Early this year, he saved the life of a very important native personage in some uprising in Cairo and was rewarded with a magnificent ruby. This jewel he sent to my Uncle Timothy and me. Oh, we're the last of the Henshaws, you see. Did your brother tell you the name of this personage? Well, he didn't know it, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the whole affair was hushed up. I see. Please continue. Well, the trouble began shortly after Uncle Timothy and I received the ruby. A description of it was published in the papers, and a few days later, a message came to us from an Egyptian, Mohammed Ali, laying claim to the stone as one stolen from his family years ago. He sent an expert to our house who examined the ruby under a lens, Mr. Holmes, and then tapped it with a hammer. It fell to pieces. It was a fraud. Gracious me, an amazing thing. I'm sure that's not the end of the story, Miss Henshaw. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I wrote and told my brother what had happened. He became very suspicious and suggested that I investigate the credentials of the expert that examined the stone. I think I can finish the story for you. The supposed expert was a jewel thief who substituted a paste ruby for the real one. Destroyed the imitation and walked off with the treasure. It's no trick. Of course, you haven't been able to find any trace of the supposed expert. Well, that's the funny part of it, Mr. Holmes. Uncle Timothy and I gave a description to the police, but oh, it was a very vague one, I'm afraid. All the time, Uncle said the man reminded him of a colleague of his many years ago at the university, a professor of mathematics. He couldn't think of his name, but when we first saw the play a few nights ago, he was reminded of it. The name was Moriarty. Moriarty? But Moriarty's dead. Miss Henshaw, you say you uh, have been shadowed for some weeks. Yes, by an Egyptian. They've stolen the ruby, Mr. Holmes. Why don't they leave me alone? That, Miss Henshaw, represents a, a very fascinating problem and one that I shall be most happy to help you solve. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there go the lights again. The last act. Yes, the last act of this little play, but not, I fear, of Miss Henshaw's problems. Uh, let's meet after the act in Sir Claude's dressing room, shall we? <laughs> Well, Holmes, how did you enjoy the play? Very much, Sir Claude. May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do, Sir Claude? How are you, Doctor? I see you've already made the acquaintance of Miss Hanshaw, and she, no doubt, has told you her troubles, eh? Yes, Sir Claude. And Mr. Holmes has promised to help me. Splendid. Uh, tell me, Watson, how did you like the play? It was uh, very interesting, Sir Claude. Not quite accurate, of course. Well, you, you have to allow us a little dramatic license, you know. Uh, what did you think of Rodney, the man who was portraying you, Doctor? Well, since you mention it, I think the fellow needs to study diction. He, he mumbles so much, I could, could understand what he says. <laughs> oh, come now, old fellow. I, I think there are times when you're 
A little hard to understand yourself. Oh, rubbish. Sir Claude, I oh, hope you'll uh, meet us at the Diogenes Club and then we can go out and have some supper. Excellent idea. I'll join you there after I've taken off my makeup. Splendid. I think I should be going home now, Sir Claude. I gave my address to Mr. Holmes so he knows where to get in touch with me. Very well, Miss Hanshaw, don't worry. I shall give your problem my undivided attention. I'll take you to your cab, my dear. Oh, there's no need to, Sir Claude. Nonsense, I insist. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment, gentlemen. Right, Miss Hanshaw. Well, good night, good night. Strange business, Holmes. What, what do you make of it all? Very little as yet, but it's a fascinating problem. Sir Claude really seems to uh, have identified himself with the character of Sherlock Holmes. He gave me the impression that he feels quite capable of, of solving the case by himself. Oh, hello. Claude hasn't left, has he? Oh, no, Mr. Ferris. He's coming back in a moment. Uh-huh. <clears throat> How do you like to play, gentlemen? Very much. Your own performance as Moriarty was most convincing. Yes, Thanks. yes, indeed, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations. A couple of times there, I had a strange feeling that you, you really were Moriarty. Well, that's very flattering, Doctor. Oh, hello. Well, it sounds as if there's some trouble at the stage door. Hey, excuse me. Come on, Watson. Let's follow him. Right. Hello, it's Claude. He seems upset about something. Yes. What's happened, Sir Claude? Oh, there you are, Holmes. I, I just see Miss Hanshaw off in her cab when a foreign-looking fellow came out of a doorway and got into another cab. I heard him tell the driver to follow her. I, I tried to stop him, but he got away. It must be the same man that we saw in our box during the play. Uh, Sir Claude, we have her address. I think we'll drive there at once and see that she's arrived safely. We'll join you later at the Diogenes Club. <laughs> Go. Off on another adventure? Yes, and one that may give us an opportunity of crossing swords with Moriarty once more. Oh, Moriarty's dead. He was killed when you and he fell over the precipice in 91. He was supposed to have been killed, just as I was, but his body was never found. It's impossible, or rather possible, that he returned to pour into the ears of Colonel Moran a story as unlikely and as true as the one I related to you on that April evening in 1894. One can never... Be sure of death, old chap, until one has touched the cold skin of a corpse. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Hardly time for me to tell you about a really great Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. Did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning and pick a big, juicy Muscat grape right off the vine? Mm Mm-mm. If you've ever done that, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is the color of golden sunshine with a flavor to match. Serve Petri Muscatel after dinner some evening, or serve it any time friends drop in. It's a wonderful way to express your hospitality with a wonderful wine, a Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair have become involved in a strange mystery concerning a stolen ruby, a frightened girl, and an Egyptian who appears to be shadowing her. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are standing in a darkened alleyway adjoining the girl's house. Holmes, Holmes, look, look, look. That Egyptian fellow. He's pacing up and down in front of our house. Yes, therefore, we may assume she's safely inside. Uh Uh-huh. Holmes be giving up. He's he's coming this way. Flatten yourself against the wall. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Who are you, please? We are friends of Miss Hanshaw, and we're very curious to know why you've been following her. I'm sorry that I cannot answer your question, <clears throat> sir. Now, look here, my man. You're talking to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You are a Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm greatly honored to meet you, sir. All my life I have known of you. All my life I have admired you. Then in that case, perhaps you'll answer my questions. Uh, why have you been following Miss Hanshaw? Because it is my duty. What do you mean, your duty? Perhaps I should have said my destiny, Mr. Holmes. For two generations now, the family of Arabi, of which I am a humble member, have dedicated their lives to finding the stolen treasure of Ashut. What on earth all that got to do with Miss Henshaw? Hmm? The treasure of Ashut is a giant ruby. It was stolen many years ago from the family of Muhammad Ali. A few months ago, Miss Henshaw received a mysterious ruby. I have found out many things, Mr. Holmes. I have many sources of information. Then I must regard you in the light of a, a rival detective in this case. I hardly call myself a detective, Mr. Holmes. My life is dedicated to only one problem. Miss Hanshaw now says the jewel was stolen from her. 
I do not believe it. That is why I watch her. If I am wrong this time, and I do not think I am wrong, then my quest must go on. Always it will go on. Permit me to wish you the best of luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night. Good night. Sure, we shall meet again. Oh, why did you let him go, Holmes? Why not? He's frightening Miss Henshaw. But not molesting her, old chap. In fact, it might be a good thing if someone is keeping an eye on her. And meanwhile, Watson, let's see if we can find a cab and get back to the Diogenes Club. I don't want to keep Claude waiting. <laughs> Has the Claude Horton arrived yet? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He and another gentleman came in about five minutes ago. They went up to the library. The other gentleman has just left. I see. Thank you. This way, Watson. I'm sorry, Sir Claude. We've kept you waiting. We took a little longer, but... Sir Claude! Great heavens! What's the matter with him? Holmes! I... I... I found the answer. Too late. It's... No, 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 sir. Don't try and stand up. You're, you're ill. What are you trying to tell me? The ruby. The ruby. Moriarty. The answer. The answer's in the book. In the book. Sir Claude. Holmes. He's been stabbed. He's dead. Just as he was trying to give me a message. He was muttering something about the ruby and Moriarty. And twice he said, it's in the book. Yes, there's a book still in his hand. It's a copy of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. His thumb's marking a page. It's the story of the purloined letter. Thank you, Sir Claude. You delivered your message. Come on, Watson. If we want to catch a murderer and a thief, we must go back to the Savoy Theatre as quickly as we can. <laughs> Why do you suppose Sir Claude was murdered? Because I was too curious. I've been investigating the problem of the stolen ruby and I found out something. Something that he promised to tell me at supper, you remember? And so he was killed by a man who came with him to the club tonight. Fortunately, he gave me a clue. By indicating Poe's story of a purloined letter. But I still don't see that how that helps you. Well, it leads us to the ruby. The premise of Poe's story is that the most obvious hiding place is the safest. Now, what uh, physical object was most prominent on the stage in tonight's play? By Jove. A a ruby. Exactly. How better can you hide a stolen ruby than by exhibiting it night after night as a stolen ruby before the eyes of thousands? Well, you you mean you expect to find it in the the property room backstage? Precisely. That and a murderer. Wait for us, cabby. Come on, Watson. You have your revolver, old chap? Yes, I do. Well, keep it handy. Our visit may not be unexpected. Unlocked. That's good. Come on. Look, Holmes. Look. The doorkeeper. He's slumped over his desk. Hmm. He's been given chloroform. We'll take the liberty of borrowing his lantern. Oh. It's an eerie atmosphere. About a dark and empty theatre in the home. Now, where will the stage properties be kept, I wonder? Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, old fellow? Yeah. That's it. Aha. Uh-huh. Look over there. A large cabinet. It's marked property department. And it's unlocked. Oh, this is frighteningly easy. Let's look out for a trap. Now, let's see. Look, look. There's a ruby lying on that tray. Yes. Hold it up under the lantern, Watson. Exactly. It's as I thought. This is no paste stage property. It's a genuine ruby. In the light of this lantern, it's very hard to... Down, Watson, quick! He nearly got us. Smashed our lantern. Yes, he's got an air rifle. A powerful one, too, confound it. There's no flash to indicate where he's firing from. Of course, he's baited his trap so neatly that he knows exactly where we are. I'm going to take a shot at him. I can't see anything, but at least it'll let him know that we're armed. Now, move your position quickly, Watson. Just missed me, Holmes. This is hopeless shooting in the dark. Yes. I've got to switch the stage lights on. Keep him occupied, old fellow, will you? Well, I try to find the light switches. I've got him. But he can still shoot, confound it. Yes, well, I found the light switch. Keep your eyes skinned, Watson. I'm turning it on. There he is, Holmes. Up in that box. Getting away. After him, Watson. We can jump over the footlights into the box. Ah! 
played the bird has flown, Watson. I should have remembered that theatre exit doors always open from the inside. No, no, he didn't get away, Holmes. Look on the floor there. It's that Egyptian fellow. I hope you haven't wounded him too badly, old chap. I don't care if I have. He was trying to kill us. No, it's only a shoulder wound. He's fainted, infernal scoundrel. No, he's a very gallant man. Undoubtedly, he was trying to save us as you shot him just now. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? Obviously, he's Moriarty. No, Watson. Moriarty just escaped through the door you heard clang a few moments ago. Then what's this man doing here? As a fellow detective, undoubtedly, he followed us. Perhaps he preceded us. When Moriarty started shooting, this man tried to capture him and got wounded by you for his pains. Then who is Moriarty? He must be someone connected with this theater. It's obvious. Moriarty is Moriarty. What? You mean Frank Ferrers, the fellow that played the part on the stage? Again, remember Poe's story of a purloined letter. But why didn't, didn't you recognize him? Oh. Remember, I haven't seen him for 20 years, and you haven't forgotten his genius for disguise, have you? What incredible audacity. How better could Moriarty conceal himself than by announcing nightly to the theater-going public that he was Professor Moriarty? And he killed Sir Claude. Of course he did. Sir Claude must have persuaded Moriarty to go to the club with him. Probably he hoped to expose him in front of me, but Moriarty found out that uh, Sir Claude knew too much. Yes. So he stabbed him. Rush back here to bait his trap for us. Yes, 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 yes. But, but how did he know that we'd uh, we'd walk into it? Well, he knew that if Sir Claude had guessed his secret, then I certainly would. And so he was waiting for us. Oh, oh. Hello? He's coming too. How are you feeling, my man? The ruby. The ruby. Did you find the ruby? Yes. Here it is, sir. Tell me. Is it the ruby of Muhammad Ali? No, no. It is a fine stone, but it is not the one for which I have searched all my life. And so my endless quest must go on and on and on. He's fainted again. Ah, poor devil. Fine mess I made of this case, Watson. Oh, I don't know. You've recovered the ruby? Yes, look at it, old fellow. Before I turn it over to Miss Hanshaw, look at it well. Probably its every facet stands for a bloody deed. It's a beautiful stone. And yet this lovely bauble has cost Sir Claude his life. And that devil Moriarty still goes free. But one day, Watson, and may the day come soon, I shall meet Moriarty again. And when that happens and I finally bring him to justice, then and only then, can you write Finney to the character of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was kind of an exciting story. Tell me, did the Egyptian recover from his bullet wound? Yes, indeed he did, and rather quickly, too, Mr. Foreman. I felt very badly about shooting him, but of course, uh, I couldn't help it. Of course not. Uh, but you know, if I had to shoot someone accidentally, I, I wish it could have been the, the actor who portrayed me on the stage. Wretched fellow mumbled all over the place. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. After all, you did recover the ruby. Yes, and a beautiful stone it was. The color of, uh, well, uh, the color of a fine glass of port when the light shines through it. By a fine port, I take it you're talking about a Petri port? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, all kidding aside, Doctor, <laughs> Petri port, like all Petri wines, is good wine. And I can tell you why very simply. Petri took time to bring you good wine. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for a good many generations, since way back in the 1800s. And because the Petri business has always been family-owned, everything the family has ever learned about the art of making wine, they've been able to hand down from father to son. From father to son. That adds up to a lot of skill and a lot of experience when it comes to turning plump, juice-filled California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. So when you want a wine for any occasion, obviously you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Oh, uh, now let me see. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that occurred to Sherlock Holmes and me early in the last World War. It took place in Flanders and concerned a famous British general, uh, an actress, and a German firing squad. Boy, that sounds like a real thriller. Well, see you here next week. No, no, no. Uh, not here, Mr. Foreman, remember? Oh, of course. 
Next week, we're going to be at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood for the seventh war loan drive. That's quite right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't invite you all to my home for one of our broadcasts, but we can get together next week at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. You can get a free ticket for our broadcast by buying a war bond. And I sincerely hope that you will do this so that we can see you next week at this time. Tonight, Sherlock Holmes' adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios... This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teachers' notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Literally millions of human beings have known the sensation of leaving their native Earth and soaring above the clouds. And still, there are many for whom flight still holds a sense of mystery and wonder. That that feeling is not wholly groundless is evidenced, perhaps, by the strange experience of Lieutenant Morand. Even as far back as 1923, there were those who realized that if war should ever come again, its outcome would be, in a large part, determined by air power. And so, in France, as in other nations of Europe, men were being rigorously trained in the techniques of flying, strafing, and bombing. Second Lieutenant Morand was a member of the embryonic French Air Force. And on the afternoon of September 22nd, he went aloft to engage in shooting practice over a field near Gadeau. In front of him, in the pilot seat, was Sergeant Jean Daubert. When I give you the signal, Sergeant, begin your dive. Right now! Not good, either. Let's go back at right again. The plane circled the field and once again approached the target. All right, Sergeant. Bravo, sir. 
sir. You did it that time. You must have... Lieutenant, what is the matter? The sergeant stared at the man behind him in amazement. Lieutenant Morant had slumped back in his seat. His eyes were closed, and his face was distorted with pain. What is the trouble, Lieutenant? At that moment, the lieutenant fell forward, face down. And it was then that the sergeant saw the great red splotch spreading across his shoulders. Mordieu, he's been shot. Sergeant Aubert landed the plane as quickly as possible. And while the lieutenant was being lifted carefully from the cockpit and transferred to a waiting ambulance, he made his report to his commanding officer. We were a couple of hundred feet up, and there weren't any other planes in the air and nobody on the ground beneath us. It must have been his own machine gun that did it. One of the bullets ricocheted somehow off the ground or the target. It bounced back and hit him between the shoulders. I know it sounds crazy, but it could and not... And so be. that was the explanation that was officially accepted, at least for a few hours. But later that afternoon, Sergeant Aubert dropped around to the emergency hospital to inquire about the lieutenant's condition. How is he doing, doctor? You had to operate? I had to remove the bullet. It was deeply embedded. Imagine a man getting hit in the back with a bullet from his own machine gun. I think you're mistaken, Sergeant. The bullet I just took out of his back came from a thirty-two revolver. But where the thirty-two revolver came from, no one has ever been able to learn. The official record of the case of Lieutenant Morand was changed from accidental injury from his own weapon to injury, either accidental or intentional, from a weapon in hands of a person unknown. And to this day, the origin of that bullet remains a subject for speculation. A mystery. Incredible, but true. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio